Rock will rock. Let's All rock. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the five on five podcast presented to you by directmusicservice.com. Uh, Direct Music Service is where we get all of our edits uh, and a, a lot of remixes too. You can yeah. use our promo code 5 on 5, F I V E O N F I V E. Uh, real quick, Same. Danny Dace just came out with a, a pack, didn't he? He did. Yeah. Just he dropped a Rihanna pack. As well. Yeah, yeah, I've been playing that, which is fantastic. Same, same, uh, and uh, Phenom has a pack in there too. So just go yeah. ahead and get those. Go use our uh, our promo code, save some bucks. We're going to get right into the show here. Right. We we have such a big show today. Not going to be much talk in between. Uh, strictly strictly business today. Strictly we're, business. We're, uh, today is going to be an incredible history lesson. We are absolutely honored. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Phenom. Down the street from me. Jupiter Williams, down the street from him, Nick Lopez. <laughs> and I don't even know how to begin this intro. One of the most prominent figures in dance music, one of the most prominent figures in electro music, an absolute legend, remixes for Grace Jones, Escort, Roxy Music, the list goes on and on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Greg Wilson. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. How was how was that, Greg? I, I have a big list of things I could have said, but no, that'll do. That'll do. That's okay. <laughs> you, had about, you had about five more minutes to go. I'm, I'm kind of taken back a bit. It, 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 it's, it's always a bit like mad, you know, because there was a period of time in the when I stopped DJing in 1984, and I didn't start up again until the end of 2003. So there's like a a 20 year gap, and within that time, you know the you know, there was obscurity. There was mm. like, and also looking back <clears throat> on what had happened in the past and seeing how history was documenting it. Um, and it was leaving out what I felt was the most vital part of the story from a UK aspect, um, which I don't think you can understand what happened in the UK without that. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, I was in a position where there was more and more being written and then the internet came into play and that's when I started noticing people discussing dance history and th there were various forums a lot of knowledge out there but there was this kind of still this missing link this blind spot um, and that really motivated um, me coming back into DJ in many respects because I set up a website which was Electro Funk Roots mm. which was dealing specifically with the early 80s and what happened in the UK uh, on what we call the black scene. It was like um, a scene that had kind of evolved from the 60s with rhythm and blues and soul music. DJs back then opening up the import channels, getting music direct in from places like Chicago, New York. And then this is still in the 60s and then it moves into the 70s. It becomes more refined. A few shops open up in the country that are specializing in importing music in from America, black music. And a huge underground uh, developed, which basically really came into fruition in the uh, late 70s with the generation of black kids at that point. This was the generation um, of the riots, the riots happened in 81. A lot of these kids were out on the street and they were the kids that were coming into my clubs in the early eighties. And, you know, they were re a generation that wouldn't, you know, they were standing up for themselves. They weren't taking the shit anymore. And the, the pressures of everyday life to them, you know, obviously there was like uh, overt racism on a day-to-day -day level. There was little job opportunities. You know, there was the hassle on the street, the police, uh, you know, this whole kind of um, pressure cooker that these kids were under and the way that they released it was in the clubs. And so the level of dancing was a major thing that you, you, we don't see. We don't see it now. But, you know, uh, a, a kid could have nothing, you know, in his, his personal life but has respect on the street because they can dance and people people know that. And so, you know, the way I always describe it when people say to me, sometimes you'll get the question, what are the parties like now to the parties back then? And I kind of have to say, well, it wasn't really a party back then. It was much more intense. It was much more necessary. It was, it was an incredible scene. I'll never experience the likes of it. And those nights that I had in Manchester through 82, 83 at Legend, 
that's as high as it gets for me on a DJing level because that's literally being right there with an audience who are totally into what you're playing and, you know, and they're responding to you, you know, and, and you need that audience to let you play that music because if they're not into it, you're not going to last. And so, you know, it was right at the cusp of a scene, you know, and, and the great thing about it was that this new music from New York was coming into play, which was electronic based, drum machine based, uh, synths, samplers, sequences. It was all coming out during 82, 83. Music was radically changing, this electro sound. And in the UK, this initially was known as electro funk. And it's, it's very hard to explain because America didn't have an equivalent scene. And a lot of the music that I talk of, of electro funk falls under hip hop. Mm. Some of the other stuff that I would say falls under boogie now, mm. which is a retrospective term from the mid 80s from mm. London, which was looking back at this, not necessarily the electronic side of it, but, you know, kind of the disco funk of the late 70s, early 80s. But into that came, you know, this whole kind of... So what I'm talking about in the early stages and the initial stages, I mean... When you're the, you know, D-Train, you're the one for me came out with those choppy synths. That was a kind of hint of something coming. And then within a few months on the same label, Prelude, there was a track called Electric Funk on a Journey, which was much more kind of getting towards it. It was also things like Stone Time. Um, Arthur Baker had done North End, back end of 81, Happy Day. So these, these, these were the tracks that were kind of bubbling but where it really come into, into its own was, was when stuff like Peach Boys Don't Make Me Wait mm -hmm. with those kind of fierce hand claps that we'd never heard the likes of before. Now, this was a new sound. And on the back of that track came Cinnamon, Thanks to You, mm -hmm. Rocker's Revenge, Walking on Sunshine, which became a big hit, you know. So these were all, and, and this is right getting round about May of 1982. And dropping into the equation was Planet Rock, which obviously was radical. And in fact, so radical at the time that people within the scene that I was involved with, certainly the more purist aspects, they thought it was dreadful that something like this might be played on a black music night. Mm. So I took a lot of flack for supporting the more overt electro sound which had come in with planet rock and and you know there would be things like uh later down the line hip-hop bebop the smirk tyrant brunson i was just gonna the, ask about that yeah you know the tommy boy stuff for you know like planet patrol and johnson crew and so yeah. you know I, I gravitated towards this music but the whole thing was that you know like within this you know like there was a a, a scene that was built on magazine there was Blues and Soul magazine was the, the main source of information. There were different specialist radio soul shows that catered for the, the type of music that, you know, I would be brought on to do mixes because the presenter there wasn't necessarily into the electro side of it. He didn't want to be playing himself, but it was fine in the con. He understood that there were people out there. And it became very political on the scene and I started to get criticism in press. Even the record shop that was selling me the stuff was, was criticising the music I was playing. And I, I was like young at the time, I was what, 22 and a lot of ego as you have and wanting a pat on the back. My clubs now are like the biggest clubs in, you know, in, in the region, maybe in the country, you know, like these midnight midweek clubs at Wigan Pier and Legend on a, on a Wednesday, Wigan Pier on a Tuesday. And people are saying, I'm ruining this scene that I love, you know, this black music scene. And, and you know, and that was hard to bear at first. And then I kind of looked at the situation more clearly and said, but the people that are telling me this, from my perspective at 22, were middle-aged white guys. I said, who, who are they to say what a black... Look at the kids in these clubs. This is what they're into. Because they, they, they said something as well. I remember they, they said a comment, you're leading them astray, they said. You're leading them astray. And I, my attitude to that was, you don't lead these kids anywhere. They are the leaders. Right. What you can do is meet them. You can connect with them, with the music you're playing and meet them. But you're not leading them. You know, 
they're, they're the ones who make their own minds up. So who are you to say what this is? And it, it put a different emphasis. And I want, I went more on the offensive almost with that, you know, um, but it all, you know, it was a hard time because as I say, there was a lot of resistance to it, but my clubs were like just booming, you know, it's, and, um, and eventually it just swept through and it changed the scene. So what was previous to that was we were coming out of the jazz funk era and there was a lot of British jazz funk records that were being made as well, kind of, uh, you know, 1980, 81. Um, we were always playing soul and funk, you know, um, and what we call disco funk, which was was later termed boogie. It was, it was, well, it, it's dis disco music was always a black music. And then it became, uh, Saturday Night Fever came and, and it just became something else to a lot of people. And the differential was, you know, the disco funk was still the black side of disco music. And we were leaving aside maybe the European and those kind of aspects that were coming in there. So it, it was serious kind of appreciation of black music, which, which the British have, you know, going back into the 50s, even you, I could go earlier than that. They have this obsession with, with black American music. And, you know, so that's where it stood. And then this electronic music came in, which within maybe a matter of nine, 12 months, flipped the whole thing on its head so that I found myself in a position of power. The music I was playing in the clubs now was being requested in other places. Other DJs were being forced to either play this or ignore it and maybe lose in the crowds. And the scene changed and, you know, other great clubs came along like Powerhouse in Birmingham did all day as Rock City in Nottingham. And this whole electro thing, and this is important from a, a, a North, I mean, again, within the UK at that point in time, there was, it, you talked about the North and the South. So London and what was happening there was one scene. The North was another, but the North also encompassed the Midlands. So we have Birmingham, Nottingham, you know, and the Yorkshire place like Sheffield, Leeds, all this was interconnected and how it interconnected was that there was an all day circuit. So on most Sundays and on bank holiday Mondays, the, the main DJs at all these clubs around the North and Midlands would come into one venue and there'd be an all day event there where they would play, you know, for a couple of hours. So it'd start around about two o'clock and go on till, till, till midnight. And these all days were like a, a key part of the scene and it was also if you as a dj got yourself on the old days that was a real step up the ladder you know you had to be there to 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 be taken seriously you know just as you had to have the music to be taken seriously you had to spend the money to get the music because imports weren't weren't cheap so you know, the, 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 we had an intricate kind of scene that interconnected all sorts of different cities. And Electro, I stopped at the end of 83, but all this continues on. Electro is still the main music that's being played. But into this now is coming a few records here and there. In fact, one before I stopped DJing that I used to play was Clear by Cybertron, which was a Detroit record. But I didn't know it was a Detroit record at the time. I think it was on Fantasy, which was like, um, that, that's like a, a, a West Coast label. Um, so I, I didn't quite work out, you know, that it was a different city even than New York or whatever. You know, you just play the, play the tunes. But then you learn, okay, this is the start of Detroit and what Detroit's doing. And um, But there was no techno, of course, then. It was just another electro record for us. I don't know how it was viewed in America. I don't know, you know, if, even if it, how did it do in New York, even Cybertron? I've never even thought of that. Was it something that was mainly just in Detroit or did it, did it kind of reverberate out? So this was like, you know, uh, an example of something coming from somewhere else, not New York. Uh, and the house, the early tracks and DJ International also, again, were played within this context. And so House came out of Electro almost from the UK side. It was another, it was another type of Electro until somebody said, 
oh, this is house, house. and this is what it is. And, and then people learn the warehouse and blah, 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 and everything starts to come together. But in that period, so that period, probably 84, 85, you know, before people were even kind of aware of that, it was still played alongside the electro. London had a different trajectory, though. Something different happened in London. Was that, um, they Obviously, hip-hop's now coming through. and we're, we, we, we didn't even know the term hip-hop until hip-hop bebop, end of 82, and even then it was just a record title. It wasn't till maybe back end of 83 it started being used more and we started becoming more aware of what it was and how it connected from the Bronx and all these things and as people are learning this obviously the, and they're getting into the, this you know the message has been by then you know so it's it's rap is no longer what it was from Sugar Hill which was people thought it was a novelty it was a one-off hit now all of a sudden we had a socially conscious lyric that was you know, on a serious record, um, rap was here, rap, and and that's how we saw it, it was rap. But something like the message was was electro from because it was electronic backing. It was mm. the way that it was presented. So, you know, in London, they uh, uh, they they started to dig deep into where the breaks were coming from on these hip hop records, and out of that came what's called the rare groove scene because they were looking for 70s funk in the same way that Northern soul sensibility of digging deep for 60s kind of soul. Um, they applied that to it and started pulling out, you know, these, these records. I mean, you know, some of the records, you know, were played at the time back in the early 70s in the UK, you know, they just rediscovered them, so to speak, or the others were, you know, obviously the James Brown thing was huge with that. So the rare groove scene in London became a massive thing and it also tied into warehouse parties and was a precursor in lots of ways to raves when they started to originally come about. Norman Jay obviously very heavily involved with that and um, they also played Boogie so it was Rare Grooves and Boogie and Boogie was as I say late 70s early 80s disco funk you know um, and that's what was happening there so this scene disconnected it in a sense so when house music happens in London, it comes more out of the gay clubs. Mm. When house ha music happens in the North and the Midlands, it comes out of the black clubs. Mm. So there's a completely different trajectory to how this, this actually came about and happened. And mm. a lot of the documentation on dance culture in the UK, I think when 88 happened and Ray just went off massively and ecstasy came into play and everyone was high and loving each other and it was this great kind of vibe that was going on. A lot of people came into dance music who six months previously would, would have hated dance music. They were told it was shit, it wasn't real, it wasn't proper, it wasn't like a band, you know, they, they just looked down on it. Now all of a sudden they loved it, you know, and they had the pill and they were on the dance floor and, and also a lot of people who started documenting this scene did this. and. What happened in 87 was a group of DJs had gone to Ibiza, uh, Paul Openfold, Danny Ramplin, um, Nicky Holloway, and who's the fourth one? Who's the fourth one? It's got away from me for a second. But anyway, it was, it was a guy called Trevor Funk, whose party it was, and they came over there and they saw this DJ Alfredo play. They took ecstasy for the first time. He was playing what they called Balearic style, which a little bit of lots of things, even a bit of pop thrown in, a bit of rock thrown in, a bit of how, a bit of disco, you know, it was a bit of a kind of mishmash, but this was a kind of thing that wasn't happening in the UK at the time. They, they loved this vibe and they came back to the UK and they decided that what they were going to do was launch club nights. And this is where the whole acid house scene in London evolves from, and, you know, Shoe and Spectrum and these places. But... The, the thing that, that, that kind of happened was that a lot of people who came to dance music at this point, and it did come with such a massive bang, we had the tabloid newspapers saying this acid house is evil and everything, do these cartoons. And the moment you do that, you're going to have a million kids wanting to find out what it is. So it was almost perpetuated by the press, you know, by the vilification of, 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 
of this acid house scene or whatever. And, you know, so, you know, the, the, the trajectory from the North and the trajectory from the South to arrive at this point and this huge explosion, well, then that people start to assume and, and the assumption that was made was this house music was brought back somehow from Ibiza. So people, this Ibiza myth came about where people believed that this was year one in effect. Mm. And everything ah. that had gone before disconnected from it. Now with the Hacienda, this is another important aspect in terms of how this culture isn't properly understood. I went to work at the Hacienda in 1983. I was only there for about four months. It was a difficult at the time. It was a members club. It was struggling to find it, its direction. Its audience was largely students, you know, like um, who were into indie music. And this is where they were at, but they'd seen what I was doing at Legend and they wanted to bring this into the Hacienda. They give me the Friday night there. It was a huge club. It was cold at the time because it was winter. It was never full. It was a struggle. We had some really good one-off nights. We had Houdini came and played live, a British act called Nutriment. We had a huge big break dancing competition there. But overall, it was a struggle. I mean, the DJ booth at the time was to the side of the stage that you you were like, you saw people's feet through a slit. It was, mm. it was a nightmare. They just didn't have it worked out. They moved it the following year onto the balcony position where which became the iconic spot. So but what I'd done with the Hacienda is brought in this black crowd that were coming to Legend on a Wednesday. Not, not the full amount of them, but enough people. And, and the main ones were a crew called Broken Glass. They were like the first breakdancing crew out of Manchester who I ended up managing, you know, by default in a way. Um, but they came in the Hacienda. They kind of danced while I was playing. We were trying to, I also did the Saturday night with their normal crowd and tried to acclimatize their crowds with this music that I was, was playing. And um, But they loved Broken Glass. They loved the breakdance and they became kind of mini celebrities there. So after I'd gone, people were still coming in and, and the black crowd started to latch onto the fact that the dance, because it wasn't very busy, there was loads of dancing space. And we had some like serious kind of jazz fusion dancers called Foot Patrol who adopted that style of dancing to the earliest house. So the very earliest, you know, dancing in the UK to house music is very foot based. Mm. Whereas later it was all the kind of hands in the air, the kind of mm. thing. That's because everyone sardined into it. So the Hacienda was playing house from 86. And um, basically, it was the black crowd. That, in fact, the, the, the first big kind of track that he picked up on there was Adonis No Way Back, which was brought to them by a, a black guy who came in with a couple of records and said, will you play that? So it was, these were bringing the music into the venue and DJs like Mike Picker and stuff were responding to what was going on there. And they built a really strong Friday night in the, this is before, the whole explosion, this is in the, in the kind of like 86 through on a Friday night, it's called Nude. And it was very much a black lead night. Now, when you go two years down the line and the ecstasy's hit and the clubs exploded and you look at the footage, you don't see the black presence there. And, you know, and, and I think that people would assume it was never there, but, the, what happened with it was when it it's like having your space invaded can you imagine like having this amazing kind of vibe going and you and then all of a sudden they're all in the, it, the club's packed you, you've got no room to move your feet you can only move your hands mm -hmm. and it's a different thing and and that is when the black crowd moved away from the hacienda which mm -hmm. you know it's, it's something that someone like that Brickerin talks about, and he talks about the 86 to 80 being almost the most precious time because they were playing jazz into it, Latin stuff, and, you know, the electro was, you know, and the these early house thing, and, and it was, it was still, hip hop was still being played, you know, Mantron, you know, so all this music was being played within the context of, of one night, then it became house music all night long, and it, it was a different vibe again, and that's when, the black crowd moved on and they went away from that scene. And what happened in, in a UK perspective from that was 
the black crowd took the aspects of this new kind of house rave vibe and applied these the break beats of hip hop into it and created jungle. Mm. Well, at first they called it hardcore. The, the first term was hardcore, and then it kind of went another step further, and it was jungle. And then later down the line, that becomes drum and bass. Drum and bass. But that was the trajectory of that that, that, that that came. But all these things you can't properly put together without understanding that the foundations of the whole the whole situation in the UK was built on this absolutely solid, firm, strong black scene. And it wasn't a small thing, it was a wide thing. <clears throat> but a lot of people didn't know about it because as the world is, black people do something, nobody talks about it. And that's the way it was back then, unless it's like in terms of crime or something, you know, so uh, these kids weren't getting the the dues for what they were doing in, in, in that respect. The magazines that were talking about it were um, initially, you know, like the, the specialist black music magazines like Blues and Soul, Black Echoes, you know, there's a few black music uh, was out. But away from that, unless you really knew this scene and you connected in a few columns here and there and the radio shows, you, you just weren't weren't aware of it. And, you know, the bigger magazines weren't interested in reporting on these things at the time. They were too busy with, with whatever they were into, you know. So that came later, you know, as it went into the 80s, obviously then, you know, Enemy and all these people woke up and saw what was going on and, so and dance music eventually was reported throughout the music press and a lot of that was broken down you know although not everything um and so yeah it, it became this kind of hidden thing from people and I, I think even if some of the people that were writing that when they did know about it they almost kind of oh that's too much that's too much let's leave let's leave it where it is you know and i, I still don't think now it's been given the proper respect you know, I'll give you another example. I'm going to just take a drink. <laughs> Please. <laughs> In with all this as well is um, there was a guy called Morgan Calm who came out of the record companies. He worked in club promotion. I knew him. He, he, he used to work for a label called PRT. And they they put out Sugar Hill when it first came out. So he, he promoted in the UK Rapper's Delight and, and obviously the early Grandmaster Flash stuff and, and things like that. And then he got, uh, you know, uh, a more powerful position with a label called R and B, and that was Imagination. So he he discovered Imagination, and they had, you know, they obviously blew up big in America as well. Mm -hmm. And he started his own label, and it was called um, it was called Street Wave. And his intention, I mean, he was, you know, Morgan is like a, a bit of a larger than life character. He's kind of, and he, he certainly, you know, not scared to blow his own trumpet. He was going to create a British Motown in, in West Acton, London. You know, he was like determined to do this. And he signed a few, actually he had a few decent records, but nothing really took off. And, and it wasn't kind of happening. But then he started doing these compilations. And his idea was, he knew what was going on because he knew the DJ culture. He knew about the imports, what were the big imports. And he realized that the normal kids, they couldn't afford to go and buy these imports. They were far too expensive. But what if I can put nine or 10 of these imports on one record and sell that for pretty much the price, just, you know, a bit more than an import, you know, and, uh, you know, sell an album to them. And he started doing these Street Sounds albums. They, they were massive. And in the UK chart at the time, compilations, could get in the jar and these were going in the top 10 and everything these are huge records and he started in october 83 a series called street sounds electro and th this series is so legendary in, in lots of respect i mean it was the first series of mixed albums in this country you guys mastermind um nolan maurice watkins uh did you know they mixed these these albums and he'd get like you know, he obviously was right on the kind of pulse with things. So as soon as they were coming in, he'd be licensing them, getting them on, on these albums and getting them out there. And these, again, have got blowing up massive, big albums. But also the breakdance thing exploded here initially in 83, but that was mainly with black kids in places like London, Manchester. And 84, it was everywhere. 
it was, you know, you go to Somerset or, you know, you go up like to Land's End and you probably find a little break dancing crew going on there. It just, it just blew up in 84. And this was the soundtrack, Electro, Morgan Khan. He, he must have sold so many cassettes, you know, for the Ghetto Blasters and everything. And it was a huge concern. It was massive. And those kids that bought those Electro albums, which weren't the same people that were coming to my clubs because they were... I mean, maybe some would have the tracks, but they already knew that music. So these people who are now being turned on to this electro music, you know, for me, they're the first generation of white kids who got into dance music in a big way. Mm. And they, a lot of these four years on, are the first generation of ravers. And a lot mm. of people talk about this experience of these albums and how they were you know, had such a big impact on them and everything. Yet that whole thing can be completely missing from the story. Mm. Whereas this is something that's happened on a major commercial level and brought a, an underground music to the masses. Mm. And, uh, and, and also Morgan was the first person who put out tracks, DJ International stuff with the Chicago stuff. He did lots of other things. You know, he was right on that cusp, but He's not in the story, mm. you know, and, and, and so when I, you know, did my uh, Discotheque Archive series originally for DJ Magazine, which is, is, is now the book, you know, these are the kind of stories I want to get out there so people, because you really cannot connect what happened in Britain without knowing about things like street sound, without knowing about the all day scene and the jazz yeah. funk scene before that and how all these people came together and how it all spread out from there. So it, all that has been fragmented and I try to do what I can to stick my finger in the dam to stop it. But in many ways you can't, but you can speak to people like yourselves who are knowledgeable about, about these things and explain this and then you can get contacts there and if enough people on that level, then maybe the, the narrative changes. And I met a, a writer, well, I spoke to a writer recently, uh, who, who said to me, you know, that I, I, you know, he's quite a well-known kind of dance music writer. And he said, you have helped change the narrative now. It's, it's you can see it, you know, uh, the certain stories that I've brought into play. I mean, the turn up now on Black History Month in the UK. They never knew who these people were. Mm -hmm. But now they, they, these stories are kind of touched upon and people are starting to come in and show that interest. So with history, I think with any kind of history, it, it takes a distance of time before you can start to change these things because people are so stuck in, in certain... And they have... Um, you know, they, they, they're invested in... in a certain way that history goes and they it's don't want to hear yeah. from that. So, to, so they don't want to hear that maybe something happened a bit differently. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting because, you know, you watch documentaries and I think like pump up the jam is a big one where they talk yeah. about England and it, it kind of starts right where you're saying, like it starts right when the rave culture starts mm -hmm. yeah. and that's the beginning or it's like, uh, house music started in Chicago techno started in Detroit right. and then they picked it up in England and boom, all of a sudden we're raving and right. it, it completely skips over. And I think a lot of dance culture skips over the electro part of it. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. the yeah. part they into cut, the eighties or the even the, they cut out yeah. the black influence really. Yeah. Um, I think with house and techno, it's kind of hard to, because that is the Genesis is black musicians, yeah. but when it comes to like rave and like, rave culture once it grows it it does like all of a sudden you notice like you were saying greg the black kids are gone gone yeah and and they're it's almost as if the genesis starts with them not there right and so now this whole narrative begins where dance music is white music and there's ecstasy it, it, there's raving yeah. and that's what it, yeah and that's not it's, the case yeah. yeah it's just like any any other kind of history Think, it's very you know, it, I mean, it, think about american history right it, yeah just like black people start when slavery come over but it's been it's been known that you know we've we were voyagers too 
Yeah. And we did hit America a lot sooner than what <clears throat> history books are saying. It's so very interesting think, how the rewriting happens. Yes. I I think that um that it was kind of that thing too where everything got grouped into techno music. There was a time mm-hmm. in like the late nineties where they're like, This is techno. And because mm-hmm. people people were ignorant to subgenres and different you know, different this and that. And so they're like, I'm just gonna group all of this dance music and yeah. call it techno. They yeah. were calling Daft Punk techno, they were calling Moby techno, they were yeah. calling everything in the late nineties, you know, Armand, everything. And yeah. like that's just simply not true. I mean, shoot, even Prodigy, they call Prodigy Tech Cup. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and there's so many different different aspects. I wanted to ask you, Greg, do you remember your first time visiting the States and visiting New York and seeing that scene? I, I came in, I think it was uh, 2005. Uh, oh. That was the first time I was here. I, I, I didn't... Everything from was, you know, New York just had massive influence on me, but I'd never been there. Uh-huh. Mm. You know, it was it was only you know when I came back as a DJ that I was brought out there in two thousand and five. I played a place called APT, mm. uh, which is great. You know, uh, it, it was from my point of view, it was mad. You know, it was like wow, you know, I'm going to play in New York. You know, because it was such a far away place, and it was right. where everything was coming from. And so, and what what was what was really nice about it is I'd had a I, I'd done a kind of limited run record, uh, maybe six months before called it was Teenage DJ. I was a teenage DJ. It was like sampling, um, like part of I'm Your Boogeyman by Casey and the Sunshine Band. It was just this groove track. And it blew up, you know, and, and when I got there, DJs were showing me they bought it in New York and it was like, wow, this is really crazy. You know, these New York DJs are now kind of picking up on, on what I'm doing. So it's the first kind of understanding. Yeah, you know, people have kind of seen what I'm doing online. They've kind of seen me DJ or whatever. They kind of get a, a vibe of me and, and, and it's receptive. And so, you know, it was a really nice, you know, like, introduction to it and obviously mm. since then i've been you know many times and sure. lots of parts of the states and everything and uh yeah but, but i i'm always aware like even with something like you know i'm aware from the the us aspect with something like disco and when they started you see the music that i play now which is mainly kind of, i'm drawing from that kind of 70s early 80s era with re-edits i'll play contemporary tracks if you fit into that vibe mm. but it's my main kind of bread and butter of it is re-edits from the kind of 70s early 80s specifically um although i will even play house and stuff you know i mean it, it's i'm not locked into that mm. but that's you know that's where it it, it, it kind of sits so you know, I, I kind of came back into um, a situation because I used to edit stuff way back then. You know, I was editing on, on Real to Real and teaching myself. I didn't even know what was happening in New York. I knew they were editing, but I didn't, I'd seen it. No one had showed me it. I'd heard Shep Pettibone doing those master mixes mm. album for Prelude and what he, mm. he was making Sharon Red do all sorts of mad stuff. And I, yeah, well, I mean, I want a bit of that. And so I, I kind of, learned myself and was editing and did stuff back then but when i come back into it this re-edits culture got really you know mushroomed and there were all the, and, and it, obviously to do with the internet people put them up online now and stuff like that and so it played right into my hands in a sense you know because i brought my own edits into play and all of a sudden i remember one i did the first night i did um I played an edit of I Feel For You by Shaka Khan that I'd done in 84 or 83 even. And I remember when I did it, no one was interested, you know. I sent it to, <laughs> what I did, I did, I did Shaka Khan and a few other things, more well-known kind of tracks to try and get remix work. So I sent them to record companies. So I thought if I send them, you know, edits of, you know, the latest thing out of New York, they ain't going to know the track in the first place. So it means nothing to them. If I send them something like Frankie Goes to Hollywood 2 track, they know that track. So I did that with, with you know, I remember this, uh, I feel for you, Chaka Khan. And, but, you know, no one was, I, I think I got one commission through it. No one was interested. They used to say to me at the time, when I, I want to remake something. They'd say, you know, American DJs remix. 
It's DJ's got a remix. Uh. <laughs> it's got a remix. It's got to be American. You know, it was that kind of thing that I was up at banging my head against the wall. Please let me remix something. And and um, in the end, you know, it, it, I, I ended up working with musicians just trying to make music <laughs> because I wasn't getting the remix work. A really funny story came came out the other day, actually. That I it really did blow me away as well, you know, because you know when I think about it, but. It was New Order Blue Monday. It was the 40th anniversary of, of its release. And obviously they're in Manchester and the Hacienda and all the connections there. And I know they used to come into Legend. Um, a certain ratio were there all the time. And, and 52nd Street, who were like a kind of soul band on Factory, they were obviously there all the time too. So I, and, and I knew that some of the owners, like Tony Wilson, Rob Breton, who was New Order's manager, would come in, you know, so you you did that they come in, but that's all I knew. Now, there was a track, uh, Dirty Talk, Klein and MBO. I uh, don't know if you know that. Um, it later, it was a big Chicago track, apparently, and it's seen as a precursor to House. It's definitely seen as a proto house track, Italian track. Now, I used to shop at the, the only shop you could go to in the north was spinning in Manchester. It was the, the source. There were other shops that sold imports, but they bought the stock from spinning. Spinning brought it in and then distributed it to a few others. So they were the source. So all the top DJs went to spinning in Manchester and um, and got their records there. And on, on, on the, I said, as I said, you know, even in that shop, the guy who served me was like anti-electro, but the other side of the shop's business, they had a gay clientele and a guy called Harry Taylor, he looked after all the Euro stuff. And he was aware of these electronic records I was going for. And now and again, he'd go, yeah, check this one out, see what you think. And he did this with Klein and MBO, Dirty Talk. And within a few weeks, that was the biggest record on the black scene in the North. It was huge. Mm. And, you know, mm. The instrumental version, I couldn't have played the vocal. It was dreadful, the vocal, but the, the instrumental was just amazing. And right on, you know, this kind of electro tip. Nowadays, they'll call it, again, there's another one, Italo Disco. Mm. But that yeah. was, for us, that was pure electro mm. Now, DJ at the Hacienda was a guy called Hugh and Clark. And he was a black guy, you know, but he was having to kind of try and find his way in this madness of the Hacienda with all these raincoated students. But he also did the all day as he was like a, a real top jazz guy and everything. And he picked up on the client an MBO track. He got a copy. It wasn't on the, I had it on the Zanza label, which is the original Italian. He, he got it from um, Siamese, a Canadian label. It was also released in, in uh, New York on I think 25 West. And when he was playing it one night and the, the New Order guys came in and they they said, can we borrow this record as a template for Blue? They wanted to use it as a reference for Blue Monday. So there was always that nice little connection, knowing a track that had blown up on the black scene and somehow through the back door come in and, you know, had a, little, a small part in Blue Monday. And there was also another story, and it goes back to this remixing that I said. So there was the two story, and I, I posted about this online the other week on the 40th anniversary. The, the second story was when I worked at the Hacienda. So I'm this kind of young DJ, you know, like um, 23 at the time. And Peter Hook, the bass player of, of New Order, was there, and he was with Rob Gretton, who was the manager. And it was kind of the end of the night. And I was really wanted to remix some something like some. Please let me remix. I had kind of plugged up, and I went to him. Um, am I allowed to swear on this, by the way? Absolutely. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. 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 I went. I went oh, yeah. to him, and, and I said, um, "Can I remix Blue Monday?" He went, "Fuck off." He was like, <laughs> he, he was really pissed off, and you like, "Fuck off," you know, like, and I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa," and you know, and, and it was one of them that. I kind of kept with me all, you know, through the years, it was always, oh, I remember that time, geez, oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> I really upset him and everything. And so then he put his book out, and probably about 2008 or nine or something, The Hacienda, How Not to Run a Club, which is a fantastic book, you know, the yard, because it was all New Order's money that was used to keep the Hacienda afloat in the early days. Mm. And he tells this story, and I'm like, whoa, you know, I didn't even think he'd remember that. And he wow. said, how he told me and he thought it was the most disgusting thing anyone could ask that you know to tamper with their music but now 
remixes yeah you know, better than the original <laughs> and I don't, I don't you know it kind of didn't you know have much contact with me after that but he he knew i did a, a mashup of uh, new order and rockers revenge and he was like so it was it was amazing in the first but you know so it was a real positive at the end of that it was like bloody hell i didn't realize that so i related, these, awesome. I related so cool. these two stories in the post but then somebody kind of uh texted uh, tweeted and said something to the extent of i've never heard you tell this story but were you an influence on blue monday <laughs> And, he, and I thought, well, you know, you can't be say I was an influence on Blue Money because I played a track that, that somebody picked up on and they picked up on, you know. Okay, I might play that track first, but it wasn't Blue Money, you know. Mm. It's a bit kind of, a bit of a jump to say that. But he put this clip in there and he put uh, one minute, 11 seconds or something, so I went to it. And Bernard Sumner, the, the singer of it, says, we went into legend in Manchester and it was, he said it was on, on a kind of fun night or something. So it's uh, my girl. And he said, and this place had an amazing sound system. And he said, and the subs and the frequencies, it was just blew me away. You know, the sub bass was, and, and this legend had probably the best sound system in the country at the time. And he said, and that was the, an influence on the production. Wow. So 40 years, that story has evaded me. Yeah, I would never. If he would have said, "I went into the Paradise Garage and the sound system was amazing and the subs and the free," and said that same story with the Paradise, because I knew they'd been to New York, New Order and stuff, and eventually they they'd hook up with Arthur Baker just after this. But no, it, it was like wow, and so you know, like I've only just realised that, um, that you know, obviously it, it makes so much sense, of course. But also what it makes me think of is that that night and the type of stuff, I would have been, Arthur Baker was the number one producer, you know, his, 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 his streetwise stuff and obviously what he did with Tommy Boy and stuff. I, I would have been playing Arthur Baker tracks that night without any shadow of a doubt. And it's almost kind of strikes me that he's hearing, he doesn't even know what the music is. It's a kind of funk night, you know. It, it's Yeah. It, and... Within six months, he'll have made Blue Monday. Arthur Baker will have heard that. And then now they're going to New York to work with Arthur Baker. And the next studio sessions are confusion, things like us, all that, that they did with, with Arthur Baker. And, and that connection, I mean, I've seen that connection come to Manchester a few times where they show like and, or New Order, and now we're in Manchester, and now we're in New York because Arthur Baker. So that connection is there. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's... To, to be able to kind of put these pieces in the jigsaw, you know, that gives you much more uh, weight when you, you're trying to put these stories across. So just, just to give you an example with the Hacienda and this story about the, the black crowd being the ones that brought the dance music into the Hacienda, um, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I told this story to a journalist from The Guardian and he, you know, he was like absolutely wanting to write something about it. And then he come back to me and he says, have you got any photos? And people just didn't take photos then. And there was no right. photos that I, no photos that I could find. Uh, there was one photo of this crew foot patrol dancing at the Hacienda, but it was a gig. They were, it wasn't right. They needed people in an order. What they wanted was proof black people were there in the Hacienda dancing, and I couldn't give them visual proof. And there was no peace from. And that history was like, and, you know, it was really frustrating. But then a couple of years later, something magical happened. And it was this footage emerged, and it was from um, Moss Side Community Centre in, in Manchester, where you've got a packed out, it's all black kids, and they're dancing to house in 1976. Mm. The, uh, you see the foot shuffling movement. This is now with over 12 months before Ibiza. Mm. This isn't a few people, this is a packed out environment, you know, and and that you know, that was like, yeah, there it is. This is what I've been saying to you for all this time. You want your proof, you want your photos. I can't give you your photos. You're not gonna run with it unless you can go, this is it. Mm -hmm. You know, 
it's there, it's there before your eyes. And it was a beautiful moment, you know, because it, it, you shouldn't need to prove these things. You shouldn't need right. to have to prove. Well, know, it's always but, there. It's always there. Even when you were talking earlier about like the 50s and 60s oh. with like the Northern Soul stuff. Yeah. Because like the skinhead movement is all just right, you know, Northern Soul. Okay? Like all these black mu- musics that are being adopted by white subcultures. Yeah. And it's like, and I don't, you know, I don't necessarily think that that group was necessarily trying to erase the black part of it, but I mean, it's always been there. So it's weird to like, do you have proof? <laughs> Is there photos? <laughs> it was so the opposite of trying to raise the black. It was almost like the people on this scene that we were at, you know, if it was a, you know, a white artist, you know, they, they really, you know, a vocalist especially, they had to be, you know, there had to be something else to be accepted, you know. So, Especially so back we, then, yeah. Like an example, you know, like uh, when I DJed at Legend, I played uh, ev- um, Everybody by Madonna, the France work of book in the dub. I would never have played the vocal. Mm. The vocal was too thin. I'm playing all these really, you know, it, people wouldn't have liked that, you know. It yeah. was like, it, it sounded it was too white, you know. It, that's the way the <laughs> way it was viewed at the time. So, but but the backing was with Francois's kind of dubbed out mix was 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 brilliant. So it was there was a lot of snobbery, you know, as well. The stuff that I should have played, I would love to have played, like some like Yaz's situation, Francois's mix. But they'd had puppets in the UK, and so you you couldn't. I mean, I got enough stick for playing Planet Right. I got major stick for playing Buffalo Gals, Malcolm McLaren, because he mm. was the Sex Pistol says. But wow, you know that record was the first one that brought all four within the video, all four elements of hip hop. It was a revelationary video for us because there it was. We, we, we this was the first time we saw someone scratch, right? right. Video. And the funny thing, well, I remember. It was a seven-inch single he had. They were in the radio studio, the world's famous brief. And I remember thinking, it's like, D- does it have to be a seven-inch? I remember like, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> because you know, we had, we'd only heard the sound. Now we were looking at, okay, that is exactly what they're doing. Uh-huh. And this was the first time that had you know come into the the the, the conscience of. And but the thing that blew everyone away from that video was the break dancing because it was the first time we'd seen someone spin on their head, and that seemed like it was from another planet at the time. I mean, yeah. now you look what's going when you see all the stuff online, what people can do. You just go, yeah, it's unreal. But back then, you know, the concept of somebody spinning on their head was just crazy. Someone walking in the club and spinning on their head. <laughs> well, like, we were. I day. was yesterday or the day before. We were looking up. Uh, broken glass. Uh, ah, right, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. And um, even I, I've been break, I've been breaking for twenty years now. So right. we were watching broken glass footage. There's one guy that I was like, oh my god, he's like, yeah. He's, some of those guys were really good. Like it, you look back at some '80s footage, and it's like, uh, you know, like you could tell it's the early days of breaking. Like yeah. they're still figuring it out. But like these guys, like had genuine like put together combos like they were good they weren't slouches well, by any means oh yeah it was and, and, and what was interesting you know is like a break yourself the early days with it they didn't have enough we, we i mean if you go back then we had the buffalo gals video i think uh there was a gladys knight video with a bit of stuff in there was there was i mean we, there were scraps. There were scraps. Very, very we little. Very, very little. Now, in the initial stage, they kind of worked out some of the basic moves of it, but they also implemented that with loads of their own moves. And mm-hmm. so there was more British personality in that early. So we used to go out on, because when I managed Broken Glass, the first thing I did with them was, I mean, they formed organically and started dancing in Piccadilly Gardens in Manchester. And then Kermit, who's like, you know, a long time friend, he was one of the dancers and he approached me and said, well, you know, this is going on. And I got involved. And what I said to him, look, what we should do is we should do a street tour of all the shopping centers around the Northwest. So Blackpool and Bolton and all these places, you know, obviously Manchester, Liverpool, places like that. And just turn up there and I'd be, uh, I'd ring the local newspaper and said, well, we got these dancers. This is a big New York thing that's going on, and they come and take photos, and and they, you know, busk. They basically kind of get a crowd around, and it was amazing, you know. And and what was beautiful about that as well, that you know, I saw first first hand is 
we go into these small places that had no black population at all. And, you know, the idea of 10 black kids jumping out of a, a minivan or whatever, or a dozen black kids, it's like a gang now, you know? So the local kids are like, what the, you know, what's going on here, you know? And, and, and in a normal situation, that would probably lead to, at that time to some kind of violence or aggression. Yeah. Whereas they watch these these like kids from the, the area kind of watch them put down this lino on the floor and pull out this ghetto blaster and put this music on. And wow, they're doing this dancing. And I watch kids gravitate towards them. They'd never met a black person before and were conversing. What is this? And there was an exchange and it was it was amazing. There was never any trouble. There was never any problem because this appreciation of the dancing. And, you know, it, so it did so much in lots of ways for race relations, you know, like the, the, the advent of breakdancing in this country. Again, something that's never been given any kind of credit in, in, in any sort of way. And as I say, the next year, it, all the white kids were yeah. everywhere doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and, and that, by that point, the, some of the black kids were pulling away from it because they were seeing like the Weetabix advert had a break dancer in. Prince Charles was being shown body popping at a community. You know, it was oh, wow. And so people were now, I don't want to be involved. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we don't want Literally what, same yeah. story that happened in the States. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, you kind of see a bit of that within, um, you know, Freshest Kids, which is an amazing yeah. documentary. Uh, uh, yeah, and you know, and it, it did. It was overkill because it was such a spectacular thing to a visual thing to uh -huh. see that so many people we want a part of this. And before you knew it, you know, the originators were like, well, "Is this looking?" You know, and and you see it, Mr. Uh, Rogers break in, you're like, "Ah." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, once the, mon once the monarchy point. gets a part of this, man. Yeah. yeah, you gotta slow down. <laughs> yeah, and also the young ones were coming through. That you kind of 30, 12, 13, 14 year olds who like had all the energy in the world, so they were challenging right. all the ones. But that's a bit like what happened in in in, um, in the Bronx, wasn't it? You know, like they kind of got younger yeah. and younger, and yeah. they were more skilled at that age and more fearless, probably. You know, mm -hmm. in what they were prepared to do. So yeah, it was it was a, it was a wonderful time to be involved with that and see it at source and how it kind of, you know, how it happened on the ground. And they eventually went on did national TV. They were like a big crew, you know. Now in British b boy kind of uh, history, if you were like a b boy now and you didn't know Broken Glass, uh -huh. you, know, you know, where's your history? People, you know, they they, they were a famous crew and. Um, the guy that you're talking about, by the way, I reckon was a guy called Danny Price. Uh, Probably. Yeah, I think so. Danny, Danny was just, you know, he, because, you know, he, he told me that once he got the videos, he said, he just watched, he said he used to do him windmills. His windmills are amazing. He said he used to kind of, his, his elbows would bleed because he'd be hitting them. But mm. he kept doing it, he kept doing it, he got it in the end and, you know, he just pushed through it. He was an incredible dancer, you know. He's, he's I he was one of the smaller him. guys on the squad, but he had yes. probably the most power. Like he was, yeah, yeah. He probably had little little glasses on or something. Yeah, you know. Yeah, there was another guy in the crew who um, didn't have the break dancing skills as Danny, but was I'd been a member of a British gymnastics t junior team who could do uh, flares from the floor, which no one could do then, you know. Yeah. But, he could so if they were in a battle or something, he's the flare guy. It, it could yeah. end it. He could just end it with that yeah. one because no one could touch it, you know. But but Danny was was the guy. Kermit, as I say, was you know um, he went on to uh, I, I managed and produced the Ruthless Rap Assassins. Kermit was was one of them. He went on to Black Great with Sean Ryder later down the line. Um, he yeah he was he was one of the first people that like moved away from it. He he decided he wanted to to start rapping and we'd put a record out in 84 by broken glass on we were talking about street street sounds more yes. than the electro they did an album called uk electro and it was on there and kermit that was the first time he, he kind of rapped on a record you know and then, then you know we're talking now really the beginnings of hip-hop culture in the uk right it's yeah just it's just start one or two people people in few people in london and it's just bubbling and in in 12 months it's it's going to be 
much much bigger and yeah. you know, we're going to come into it you know run dmc and beastie boys are then kind of releasing and then you know when public enemy released that that was that was so big in the uk they were oh, okay huge. i mean everyone i can talks, see that i can see that too everyone talks about the second now with public enemy but i, I was the first i thought the first out you know we never those sounds and oh it was just like where does it come from so you know like hip hop was was obviously a major thing within i mean, I mean in a sense as well from the black side that you what you've got is in the 70s you know the, the black population of the uk um largely although not exclusively by any sense um you know people that come from the caribbean yeah so we talk about the windrush generation in the uk but i know a lot of people who have african descent who are a bit you know a bit more than windrush you know and that's correct you know because it was like uh, a huge kind of british commonwealth and everything you know so so people drew from that but so if you walk around say like liverpool or somewhere in the 70s you'd see on all the street signs like the jamaican colors mm. and bob barley being the spokesperson of the generation so it was very jamaican kind of in so obviously there's a huge reggae scene as well and the reggae and the funk side were separate you know uh -huh. a little bit of dispute between them you know like um so you know, Jamaican culture was a huge part. Obviously, you see that later with drum and bass and jungle and all these things coming into play. Um, but what the hip hop thing did brought it really brought American culture with the younger black kids to become the overriding influence. So now it was very much, you know, like what was happening in New York and the kind of hip hop and the way people, the, the you know, the, the, the fashions, all these things, they were- Sound adopted. systems. Well, I mean, yeah, we, what we did, sound systems were there in the UK, of course, you know, like- Yeah. Going, uh, uh, you know, that's from more a of a reggae like, thing. Pardon? Because that's more of a reggae thing, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what you've got, like, say, from a UK side, you've got, if you go back into the history, right back to the the, the beginnings of things, that you have two people uh, who come over from from the West Indies. Um, you have Count Suckle and Duke Vin. And Duke Vin starts the first sound system in the UK in something like 1956. These were already connected with Jamaican sound systems. Uh, a guy called Tom the Great Sebastian, uh, who had something in the early 50s. I mean, that, that always fascinates me that in the 50s, the Jamaican sound systems are playing rhythm and blues from America. Right. There is no reggae. Doesn't no. exist. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. Yeah, they're, that's they're great. They're right. to New Orleans radio or like, and, and they're, getting the rhythm and blues in from uh -huh. America. So rhythm and blues, that, that reggae comes from rhythm and blues. It's taking the rhythm and blues and putting an offbeat to it and, and evolving that sound. And that happens right right at the end of the 50s. And that's where ska... Yeah, like the ska and the rock steady stuff. Yeah. So they came over and Duke Vin started his sound system and then Count Suckle got a sound system. But Count Suckle became a resident DJ in, this, in London in a place called the Roaring Twenties in the early 60s where he was playing R&B and, and Scar and all this. And, and you know, all the pop stars, you know, like Mick Jagger and stuff would lend records from him. And, you know, the, the, these these people were like really influential. There was a guy called Guy Stevens, who there was a club called The Scene in London where the mods went. And he's like right at the roots of that importing of, you know, American music and everything. And, and in Manchester, there was a guy called Roger Eagle at the Twisted Wheel. And he, again, blues and rhythm and blues was his thing. And he played there till the mid sixties, they moved location. And the next wave of DJ started to kind of go for a faster style of music. And then they started to dig back. So they started in 1968, 69, maybe to go back to 64 and find a record and revitalize it. And this club, the Twisted Wheel is where Northern Soul it originates because gotcha. a journalist called Dave Godin went in there, heard what was being played. It was different than what he was hearing in London, which was a little bit more funk based, kind of the James Brown thing was starting. And and he called it Northern Soul because it was in the north of England. Uh -huh. and, and, um, and then that just becomes a whole, <clears throat> whole thing within itself, you know, uh, 
a subculture within itself of digging yeah. deep. I mean, DJs going to America, sitting in warehouses or, you know, for weeks on end, not even hearing the records, but looking at the labels, looking mm. at the producers, look, I like the look of this. You know, Ian Levine was shipping thousands of records back to the UK. Like, he, he had rich parents, and he, he, I think they had a house in Miami, and he got... He'd it, ship it, it thousands back, and him and Colin Curtis would sit through those records over the next months, and out of them, here and there, would come what are now Northern Soul Northern classics. Soul records, you know, yeah. the, 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 so again, you know, this is these people at the very beginnings of this scene. People like you know Duke Vernon Count Suckle and Guy Stevens, Roger Eagle. The, these were the the foundations of. of what the British side, and so for me, what happened with the British had its own lineage. So you always got to take into account mixing didn't take off in the UK till the eighties. Okay, we knew about it before that. Some people had tried it. We didn't have the equipment. It didn't work. If it gotcha. was on a couple of different turntable, you wanted to manipulate it with your hands, and record jumps. So, so you could get away with a few bits, but. It was a microphone-based culture. DJs used the microphone. But that changes in the early 80s, and that's when I made the switch. When I started working with, you know, now I'm working with, like, a 90% black crowd, and they're not interested in DJs kind of patter on them. They, music, pure music, is a music crowd. So apart from the information-based stuff, letting them know about these all days that were happening, I, you know, I, I also back announced records. I had a big thing. I wanted them to know what the records were. But in the end, I started doing lists, record lists, and I they'd come up to me and say, what's our record? And I'd tick it off on the list, and they could go into spinning and buy a copy and everything. So it was then, I, it was moving. I was I was seen as a mixing DJ mm. as well. That's one of the things. No one else on that scene in the North was mixing. There was a guy called Froggy in London who was was doing, doing it. Um, and yeah, so that gave me another kind of, so really what it was, legend, I have the right environment because the sound system's off the scale. Rig and Pier as well had the amazing sound, but legend took it, you know, it's more compact club. The music, this new electro, brand new music was coming in, which was suited to this sound system, which was suited to this mixing, which now I'm deciding I'm going to go in that direction. Mm. So it was a perfect storm, you know, the, the, the crowd, the crowd, yeah. you know, uh -huh. you've got, you know, you're on the cusp, you can't go anywhere. You can't go anywhere else from this crowd. It's not a better crowd to find, you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you've got them, you, you're there. And that's how I felt with it. It just every, I couldn't wait to get there on a Wednesday night. Mm. You know, new music, and, you know, and they're gonna love this, you know, it's gonna be amazing, you know, and it was like that. We had queues up the road. Uh, it was crazy on a Wednesday night. But even Madder, in a sense, was Wigan Pier because much bigger club. So it was it was never like, I think it held probably a thousand. So we'd get like maybe 450 in on a Tuesday night. But on a Tuesday night in Wigan, which had literally a handful of black people lived in Wigan at the time. Mm -hmm. I, I knew them all probably because I lived in Wigan myself. On some Wednesday nights, we'd have four, three, four, even 500 black kids from, from Birmingham and mm -hmm. Bradford. And they, on a Tuesday night, they'd come to Wigan because that was where the music was. Right. They were going to be where the music was. And, you know, the dedication on that scene, you know, again, an off-told story, because I remember, like, meeting a, a group of lads from Birmingham, and they said when they used to come up to Wigan Pier on a Tuesday, said the first thing they did when they got to the car park, they had a shady look around and they siphoned petrol off a car. They found a car to siphon petrol off to get back. <laughs> <laughs> they had enough money to get down. Yeah. The 50p or whatever it was to get in, but they had to get back. And by hook or by crook, they had to be there. Mm. So in a similar way, you know, I used to do mixes for Piggly Radio again, which were like, Piggly Radio was a big station, the whole Greater Manchester area is a commercial radio station, so it's quite a big concern. And I was doing these mixes for them, playing all this new music and everything. But obviously there was a radius that it could broadcast to. And, you know, I'd hear about people driving from Birmingham to a motorway service station just within the, you know, the receivership of the radio, mm. just to listen to the mix and then drive like an hour and a half back home again.
Mm. And that was it. They, you know, it, because it was this, you would hear something for the very first time. It was, right. it was so on, you know, we couldn't be quicker. You know, the only thing we could do is get over to America and get the record, but we still get to have to get a flight back. You know, it was right. Only, well, Might as well pay for it. As soon as it's imported in, get it, and it's on, and it's out there, and and it, you know, it was an amazing scene. You know, that the, a lot of great DJs involved in that scene, um, and a lot of great club nights, and uh, but the crowd. You know, as I say, that was that 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 was that generation of kids that had said, "Now nah, we're not taking." You know, their parents had tried to do the right thing, toe the line. They thought that they would be welcome. You know, they they really loved the Queen. You know, it was mad. You know, a lot of those mm. people you know, from from West Indies. They they were. It's like uh, did a record with the Rap Assassins, and one of the guys who, who wrote a track track called that one was, and it wasn't a dream. You know, he was almost saying that they. They, they were more British in, in, in a certain sensibilities than the British. Mm -hmm. And then they got here and realised it wasn't a dream, it was a nightmare. It was, right. you know, they weren't welcome. The, you had, you know, politicians who were like, basically, you know, like the the famous Rivers of Blood speech. I don't know if you heard of that, Enoch Powell, which really was a divisive speech saying, it would talk about repatriation and everything. But the, the the fact of the matter is that three quarters of the British public agreed with him at the time, sixties. Mm. You know, it, because that was the way that it was here. You know, so their parents had really it, it had been bleak. You know, because a lot of these were professional people who couldn't get the jobs that they you know were trained in, who had to go and be a bus conductor or something or a cleaner, and you know, and and. So these kids had all seen their parents and how it kind of pushed them down and they were just like, no. Uh -huh. you know, they stood strong and, uh, you know, I love that generation for that, you know. They'd go out, you know, they'd go into other areas. They, when, with the old days, we were often going into areas that, you know, were like, you know, they hadn't seen black people, you know, they didn't know. And, you know, so it was it was great, you know, like that's, that's you were part of a scene that, that and it, and it was such a positive scene. It wasn't about colour, you know. It, it, it really wasn't about that because it was all about your musical sensibility. Right. You, you know, no. It's, people say to say to me sometimes, like, "Did you ever have any problems with any you know, about you DJing and legend with being a white guy?" And it was like, no, it, it didn't come back the other way around. There wasn't uh, that reverse. It wasn't a reverse. Right? They weren't interested in what colour I was. It was what they were interested in. What was coming out the speakers? Well, you were playing. Uh -huh. That was pure and simple. And that, you know, that takes it all away. And that's the great thing. It, it, it completely separates it, you know, that. And, and so the scene was a beautiful scene, a mixed kind of, you know, some clubs were more white, some clubs were more black, but they'd come together at different places and all dayers. And, you know, and, and, and it was it was a wonderful time of uh, cross pollination, you know. And you can see it in Manchester in terms of, um, you know, like towards the end of the 80s, you have bands like the Happy Mondays and Stone Roses, which were using breakbeats and drawing influences from dance and black music. You know, the, the crew that I worked with, the Rap Assassins, we'd sample indie bands and rock bands and stuff like that. There was an open, I mean, Tony Wilson always said Manchester people had the greatest record collections because they were all so kind of next to each other. So the students were next, you know, there was an area called Hume, these flats that was, they had to knock them down in the end, but they were like cheap rents and all, you, they're just really young, young people. Get, it's got a lot of Manchester history, but as I say, the cross-pollination of ideas between people at that point in time. So when you had the Manchester music explosion, like the Mondays, the Stone, you know, a guy called Gerald and 808 State doing dance music, you know, we were doing like rap, which, you know, we weren't getting as much kind of traction because it, it was all about the baggy pants and the kind of a certain kind of Manchester style at the time. But nevertheless, you know, we got like a, a lot of respect from that and and a lot of support within within the city and, and stuff as well. You know, so Manchester was a really special place to be at that time because it was wide open. And, you know, just to, to caveat that, now I'm from near Liverpool, and at the same time, all this was going on in Manchester and these amazing nights and this cross-pollination of, of the people. Liverpool, I couldn't even do a night there. I, I, I 
I couldn't because of the racism in the city. Mm. And when the riot, it, it was always racist. There was a great funk scene in Liverpool in the 70s and a DJ called Les Spain, who was an influence on me going to his club at times. And see, first time I was in an environment then where as a white guy, I was in the minority. And that was about what everything I saw, the dancing, the movement, the music, everything was what, you know, and that was legend later for me. I managed to achieve that later down the line. But the timepiece had gone by that point. Les had gone to work for Motown in, in, in London. And when the riots happened in 81, it gave that kind of racist mentality the opportunity that apart from tokenism of letting a few people in here and there, a group of black guys didn't get in a club, you know, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't happening. And so when I tried to put nights on there, you know, it, it, well, it was, it was, it was, it was the doorman who would kind of, you know, it was mm. like these thugs on the door that had scared mm. it, pull you aside and what are you doing? And he's like, what do you mean? What am I doing? I don't want them here. Mm. It's too and dark look at him in the eye saying, I don't want them. As though you, this is your responsibility. Uh -huh. So in the end, you just say, it can't happen in Liverpool. And that was such a shame, you know. Yeah. Liverpool was kind of cut off in a way. And it has such a different trajectory from, you know, and it, even with its black community, they've never had the music scenes that, you know, like Manchester's had, like Bristol has had, like London has had. And it's so sad because it's such a amazing place and an incredible community. Mm. And, you know, the talent that comes from there, but it was kind of put adrift a little bit at the time, you know. And yeah, that'll happen. I wanted to ask, <laughs> uh, in 82, when you were at Wigan Pier, were you four nights a week? Is that correct? Yes. Originally, I was the resident DJ. Okay. So when I got the job at Wigan Pier, it was the four nights a week residency. The Tuesday night was the jazz funk night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So at the weekend, I mean, musically, it was still good, you know, playing, you know, the, the the bigger tracks from the Tuesday night, plus the more kind of, it was the time of like a lot of kind of, um, we call it futurist at the time, uh, new romantic uh, bands like, uh, you know, Human League were out and stuff like that, and Gary mm. New. So it was a kind of mixture of, of, of all the kind of tracks that, Whereas the Tuesday was just pure black music, and that yeah. was, you know, the the cherry on top of the cake. You know, yeah. we, the, the, we loved the Tuesday, and, and that had been going before I came in there. Two other DJs had, had evolved that night, and it was a good night. When I first came in there, it was predominantly white. You know, it had a black presence, but it was that area surrounding Wigan is is mainly white area. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time I left, it had switched. It was a predominantly black night, and a lot of that had to do with when I went for the electro. A lot of the, the the original jazz funk crowd that were coming to the pier, they were reluctant to kind of move with that those times, and so they fell away. And I was fortunate that I picked the audience up from the black side, from like a lot of Manchester kids started to come across Liverpool people, and and then all of a sudden they were coming from everywhere, you know. So the demographic of the night changed over the the I was there for. Uh, what was it? Three years, three mm. years, I think, you know. Mm. Which is no small. So, yeah, I mean, I, and about halfway through that, I stopped being the four night resident. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I was completely now a black music specialist. So I worked on the Tuesday at Wigan Pier, the Wednesday at Legend. Uh, now I took a Thursday in Huddersfield at a place called the Stars Bar. And that was great for a while, but. You have to close it down. And I, I, I always did Friday in Manchester. So I did a few clubs, one called The Exit, Bertie, and then the Hacienda. That was a Friday night. So um, I suppose Saturday I was thinking of doing Liverpool, but, you know, kick that in the head. So they, they were, you know, <laughs> they, they, they were mainly my nights and then the all dayers on the Sundays and the, the bank holidays and stuff. And at, at 23, you chose to pivot and shift more into production. Were you facing any burnout at that time from DJing so much? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have necessarily thought so at the time, but now I look back retrospectively, absolutely. I've been DJing since I was 15 in clubs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, it's, it's not like now we maybe DJ the weekend or whatever, you know. It, it's I was DJing like, for a period, I remember looking in an old kind of diary that I'd done, that, 
over a period of about four months, I'd had two nights off or something. I was working every night, you know, consistently. So, you know, we even get to, when I got to the pier and it's four nights, that, that was almost luxury that I had a few nights off because I would be really well paid by that time. But earlier, you had to make the money up by doing the gigs, you know. Yeah. You, if you, I mean, the, the, you know, I was a professional DJ. It was my job. Most people did it uh, as a hobby then, you know, and kind of had a day job. And did. so, you know, I, first night I ever worked, I got six pound for it. And I, I thought that was good, you know, like, so, so like, and then, you know, so I get 10 pound. And then you really got in the big league because you were 20 pounds. But when I came to the pier, they paid me, what was it, 44, 42 pound 50 a night it was. It was like, whoa, I've hit the jackpot on this, you know. So, you know, and then with the all dayers and stuff, you can start kind of naming a fee. So you get like more like 100 pound for that. And then, you know, I started to kind of take some of the door, do a deal with them. Mm -hmm. Numbers came in through the door. When Legend blew up, you know, I was getting the top the top rate every week you know so you know i was doing really well but it wasn't like it is well you know it wasn't what, like it was 10 years later even you know like djs were still most djs in the uk were getting like you know 20 quid which would have been about what well, what would have been then about 40 dollars, 30 dollars or something mm, mm. for a night you know i i think david Byrne mentions something in his book you know um it's not work because it shifts into an obsession where you're like i'm enjoying what i'm doing so much that four nights for you as a residency was just having fun you know and then it catches up with you and you start to when you look back on it you're like i was burning the candle at both ends you you know you're doing all day whatever and then uh on top of buying music and you know maybe even re-editing and doing even more it's a lot it's It's a a heavy workload you just live it, you know, everything yeah. revolving around that. Everything yeah. is revolving. And I, you know, I was very serious about what I did. You know, I think I thought about things differently than other people. You know, I always had ideas of where, you know, I thought things could improve or, or mm. whatever, you know. So, you know, I, I think there was a lot of kind of mental exhaustion as well with, with, with the whole thing and to build it up and it, it came to a point and, and uh, weirdly you know the, the first thing that made me think was the break dancing again mm. and I'll tell you why I, I, we did a big competition and we held it throughout different clubs Wigan Pier, the Hacienda Legend and you know there was two aspects to it there was an individual championship and there was a crew like team kind of thing and everything went you know well until the 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 crew competition went off and by this time we talk about broken glass i was now helping them to kind of do their stuff and on the night of it these crews weren't entering i'm like why 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 are nottingham going in why aren't these going why why aren't they why aren't you doing it and waiting for them to kind of say yeah we're coming in the competition and they said, oh, no, Broken Glass is going to win it because you're the manager. You're never, the manager. <laughs> never thought it through properly. And <laughs> I realized <laughs> what I'd done is I'd totally compromised my, you know, impartialness with it. I was now connected to Manchester. Mm, yeah. Before it was, and that kind of, you know, and I, so that was one aspect, but the the other one was that breakdancing, as I say, initially everyone loved it. Everyone loved it when some when when, when they saw somebody kind of getting down. Uh-huh. Close, you know. But when that's gone on week after week, and in the club, if you play something remotely electro, there's a rook of guys challenging each other, and the testosterone is at full pelt. That at some point the girls are going to go off oh, for fuck's sake. Yep. Mm, yep. <laughs> and that's what was happening. I could sense a, a, a schism emerging in the yeah. scene. And what it is, is just the start of hip hop. There's hip hop. Yeah. But there's this other thing going on. And so there was a kind of change, you know, like after I kind of come away from it, this hip hop thing was more evolving. I mean, it, it never all, all separated, it was always kind of together. <clears throat> But then there was this big kind of like street soul vibe and a lot of the early 
UK stuff like loose ends and cool notes mm. and things. Mm -hmm. They were influenced by things like you know the system. You were in my system and, uh -huh. and these things. That started to evolve aside for a little minute, but then house was coming in as well and bubbling. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, but as I say, you know, even even in the early house days at the Hacienda, the hip hop was still being played, you know, alongside. It, it wasn't all separated in different mm -hmm. nights. It was, it was still, you know, when you say a jazz funk night, it wasn't just jazz funk. It was soul. It was funk. It was disco. Right. You know, it, it was the best of black dance music, basically. Uh -huh. But jazz funk was the predominant. So, and like electro funk, the same. That was the predominant. But I was still playing you know, more orthodox jazz. stuff as well. And, and bits of jazz as well, because jazz was always like a bit, we'd have a jazz break, because there was always jazz dancers like wanting to kind of show show what they could do and everything. So we're talking jazz. Say that again. Say again like, Nate. When you're talking jazz funk, are you talking like Herbie Hancock, Johnny Hammond, or are we? Well, or jazz, before. Yeah, the, jazz funk initially, you know, like, what we call jazz funk would be, I would say things like, for the first examples, I mean, when you look at it, it's, it's kind of Herbie, Herbie Hancock, uh, Chameleon. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. 74, but that's almost in isolation. I think yeah. by the time you get to 76, you get a few things like, you get Donald Byrd doing things like Change Makes You Want to Hustle, which is, you can hear the jazz influence, but it's a funk track, you know. Mysterious so vibes. Then you have things like obviously Royers, Lonnie Liston Smith, um, you know, Gil Scott Heron, the bottle, these kind of, these so this is the start of it. But then it really takes on, and you know, there's loads of these records, Bob James, these kind of people coming out. Um, you know, so so many things, Chick Korea, you know, I mean, mm. remember Central Park, which is an amazing kind of fusion track. Mm -hmm. That was big when I came into the pier. That was a huge track. You know, and um, we play this kind of stuff. We we were playing like a lot of Japanese. There was a lot of Japanese jazz in the early eighties, and it was really expensive. You'd have to pay like something like fifteen to twenty quid for for one record, which was uh -huh. a lot of money. But still then. expensive. Yeah. You had to have it. If you have a cut on, if somebody, you know, if, if there was a certain cut that was blown up, you had to have that record. And the, the, why they were so expensive is they were the first uh, digital albums. Mm, mm. And it it was both Japanese artists and, and and Americans, people like Dave Brusin. I remember like there was one of the, those albums, um, David Matthews, um, and so you know there's a whole this whole space of us having to buy these really expensive digital Japanese albums because it had to be done, you know. Um, so yeah, that was the, so the period like kind of 80, 81, when I come in the pier, it's very jazz led. It's very mm -hmm. jazz led. But at the same okay. time, you've got all these prelude tracks coming through, you got all the West End, and, and I, you know, really went for that kind of sound and everything. So it was a mixture, you know, you kind of move between these things throughout a whole night, and that's how it how it worked. But the electro kind of came in and the jazz funk side was waning then. There wasn't the quality of releases anymore. There was still good stuff come up now and again that you'd still play it, but you know it it, it wasn't coming in the amount that it, it was previously. And it, it's like any kind of musical scene; it, it gets to a point where it has to change around. It has to freshen itself up. You know, it can't, you know, basically regurgitate itself continually. It right. kind of seems like it worked out that way too. Like the evolution kind of happened where a lot of jazz artists are started doing sort of electronic or electro type yeah. of sounds like so herbie well, and Rocket. Herbie, Han herbie hancock this this is the one because yeah. you've got herbie hancock in in essence kicking off the jazz funk scene by making chameleon so yep. and he's the guy who's going to you know put its death nail in there in, uh -huh. in, in 83 by doing rocket because a lot of the criticism i was getting for this electronic music what people were saying they were saying these things they were saying oh there's no soul in this that you just got to kind of turn it on it make it almost like it makes itself they thought they did they really had no value huh. but they thought it was worthless in that sense and i think marvin gay when he did sexual healing used a drum machine so that was a little uh -huh. yeah yeah but Herbie Hancock doing Rocket just knocked it out of the stadium. You, uh -huh. you know, they 
it's gone then, you know, because you, you, there's your main man. There's Herbie, you, everyone respects Herbie Hancock, and he's right. saying this is the direction. And Herbie's Herbie, even when he did the jazz fusion stuff, like people were mad at him then. Yeah, that's well, what exactly I'm about to say. It's, yeah, any deal breakers. That's that's <clears throat> what it is. If you kind of split away from it, you know, the, the, but they're the brave artists that kind of change things, you know. Right. And I always thought it was really, you know ironic that he was the one that brought that kind of scene yeah. totally to the end. It was already So dying. he kind of like when you start playing electro it's funny cuz you're like, "Well, there's Herbie again leading the pack." Yeah. And then you get Paul Hardcastle and you know all these stuff coming in. So that's that that had to have just been like a kind of a a natural almost seamless transition from jazz funk into electro on that same Yeah, I mean I did a, I did a, it's online. It's kind of a series called early 80s floor fillers. And I do. We all eight, love them. We yeah, follow yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> month month. yeah. So I do it month by month. And it's the, the 10 biggest track. I had at these record lists at the time. So I was able to kind of work out, you know, and uh, put it all together. But what, what's interesting there is when you go to the first month, you're seeing things like uh, Grover Washington Jr. has got a track in the, Lisette Wilson, which is Caveman Boots, great track. There's, there's, so there's, there's still a, a good jazz influence in that top 10. You get to, I think it's something like August or September of 82, and it's pure electro. Uh. It's, it's just, you know, wow. It, it's completely... And, and that music wasn't even thought of in that January month. Right. When, the music had changed so radically in such a short space of time. And, you know, and that's what I, I, I gone for. Although, I, although you know, as I say, I, I still did jazz breaks, you know, and and would play, you know, because there was always, you know, like really good jazz dancers on that scene. And eventually, you know, the old days, they had separate rooms for the jazz. And how jazz evolved was that um, from the jazz funk thing, and as I was saying, things coming into it now, like Chick Corea and all these, like, you know, like fusion artists and... Um, a lot of Latin stuff was coming to play, Brazilian things. You know, it, it was really getting kind of quite involved. And two DJs, a guy called Colin Curtis in the north and um, Paul Murphy in, 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 in London, basically, you know, they created the blueprint for what was called the jazz dance scene. The, the, you know, the music they played went all that way, you know, just came full on jazz and out of that, you know, you've got like things like acid jazz emerges, like okay. later. Like Giles Peterson connected, uh, you know, mm. really heavily with this and everything. So, you know, the, the the jazz thing had its own lineage. It still continues. There's still, you know, like yeah, of uh, course, yeah, uh, the jazz a jazz dance scene like going on today. You know, um, yeah, you know, even some of the old schoolers are still dancing. You know, they're in the in the fifties and stuff now. Now let me ask uh, this: Where does uh, Larry Levan? Where does he reside in your in your <laughs> history lesson that you've been giving us? Well, you know, I, I first, you know, obviously, when the, you know, in the late seventies, you had like records coming, a Tom Moulton mix, so that name became Tom Moulton. He's somebody, and uh, you know. There were Walter Gibbons, John Luongo, these kind of guys also doing mixes at the time. So we kind of aware of them, but without without probably knowing properly what a mix was, you know, right. like, mm. what, what the process of it was. But it was, you know, this guy, his name was on a lot of good records, so he must be, he must be good, you know. So now in the early 80s, I think that that was, the for me, the golden age of, of, of remixing because so many people came through at that point. Mm. Like, Francois Kavorki and Larry Levan, um, T. Scott, who I, I love his his work, um, Tony Humphreys, Chet Pettibone, Jellybean Benitez, you know, it's just like all these people and, and they were inventing things on the spot. And it is funny with, with Francois, um, we were talking before about there was, you know, like kind of influential things that happened that at the time nobody notices and we had a there was a track called love money by tw funk masters which we played on the jazz funk scene it was a bit of a oddity of a track it was kind of you know it it, it was we, we saw it as jazz funk but it was a bit kind of quirky and it was 
big trap went off mm-hmm. massive. Years later, when these books start coming out, looking at David Mancuso's list, there it is, Love Money. Larry mm-hmm. Levant's list, there's Love Money. Huh. All the Chicago guys, wow. So I, I'm like, and Wax Poetics did a piece, and I think it was L- L- Louis Vega had had it. it was they did a, it's called Twelve by Twelve. So twelve, they selected twelve, twelve in singles, and one of them was Love Money, T.W. Funkmasters. But whoever done the kind of the, the writing with it, had assumed it was the Tony Williams who was the jazz drummer. I think mm. he was either I think he was Boston from Boston or New York, whatever. But they thought it was an American record. And I remember saying, no, no, it's, it's a British record. It's by, and it set me off to track the guy down. I found him, Tony Williams, and he's he's a DJ. On, well, he was a DJ, he's dead now, on Radio London. He was the reggae DJ. Oh. Radio oh. London was a big concern, BBC station. And he also DJed in clubs in London, he, this club called Fubert on Carnaby Street. And he decided he wanted to make a record. And the reason he didn't make a reggae record was because him and another DJ were the only two people that would have played it, and he saw it as bad form to play his own record. Mm. So he decided he wanted to make, well, he, not even a dance record. He, he, he'd heard Rapper's Delight. He, he wanted to do something there. And he based it around this a, a reggae track called Money In My Pocket by Dennis Brown. And they made this track. And on the A side, is it's called Money No Love, and it's by Bo Cool, and it's a rap. And it's probably the first British rap. Although the, you could say it was, a, you know, touching on the toasting, the Jamaican toasting style, because the musicians, and the reason this record sounded like it did, when I spoke to him, they're all reggae musicians making a dance track. So it's going to come out in a different way, but it yeah. it, it was brilliant. And it now, so this track, I, and I told Tony Williams about this. He had no idea. He was, you know, you t- he said, you tell me, you know, this track, I, my first track I made is 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 influential, and I said, yeah, definitely, you know, it's really. But I didn't know how influential at that moment. Yeah. Mm. And when I found out was I did a panel with uh, Francois in London. And we were talking about, you know, it was it was also about editing and dub was being talked about and stuff. And I started telling this story about Tony Williams, Love Money, and blah, blah, blah. And then the guy who was hosting it says to Francois, right, Francois, how, how did you get into dub? And I expected Francois to say, King Tubby, you know, like Lee Scratch Perry. The, mm. you know, and he, he just pointed at me. He said, "T.W. Funkmasters love money." (laughs) 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 And furthermore to that, he says, "When I got that record, it blew me away. I was just about to go into the studio to work on D Train. You're the one for me." Oh wow! Mm. Wow. He said he used that kind of the ideas and the drops in in T.W. Funk. You know. It was his blueprint on "You're the One for Me," so that record, you know, and as I say, "You're the One for Me." I picked that out before as one of the first. Of, I wouldn't say it was electro funk by this point, but the, the sounds of it are touching on it. The next one, electric funk on a journey, it's definitely electro funk. You know, the next prelude one that goes. So, and and then you got Levan coming in with "Don't Make Me Wait." The dub sensibility. Now they're starting to bring this into play. Chet Pettibone doing. You know, like thanks to you by cinema and dubbing it up, you know, and and that was the great thing. So most of the when you you know, I talk about the music I played in the early 80s, I'd say the majority of stuff I was playing either the instrumental or the dub version, because that's where all the action was. Uh-huh. That's where these people were experimenting and doing things and trying things out. And so they brought that whole sensibility into dance music at that point in time. And he, even that's never been given the proper kind of credence. And all of a sudden, dub was in dance music. All of a sudden, records were called dub versions. Uh-huh. We didn't have that in the late 70s. Huh. There weren't dub version. There was no such thing as yeah. you know, a, a, a dance act having a dub version. But this is what... And, and to find out that it came in through... 
TW Funk Masters love money as opposed from Jamaican sources. Right. But it does, it, you know, all these things never cease to amaze me of where they enter. You know, even things like hip hop, you know, you've got the birth of hip hop is a Jamaican. A guy it's a Jamaican. Uh -huh. And, you know, like his, what he does there and this kind of merry-go-round and playing with the beats and breaks and stuff, eventually is utilised by young black kids in, in, in the UK who are making this music called uh, Jungle or Drum and Bass. And they're of Jamaican origin themselves because, you know, it's kind of this real crazy... It's spider web. Yeah. yeah. It all comes together, you know. And so, yeah, all these things have these interconnections. But I, I wasn't expecting, you know, Francois to say that a British record was his introduction into, you know, what's been a very important aspect of his career. Uh, well, I, I think a lot of people could say that the same for you. Yeah. And seeing you mix on the tube was the first time they've ever seen a DJ mix records. Well, you know, like on TV. There, there. Yeah. And it's funny because if you look at the audience there, they're just so bemused that they're, <laughs> it's, you know, they're, 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 they're going on. Place <laughs> I mean, hey, Greg, still, we're all DJs. Uh, we still have no fucking idea what you were doing, man. Yeah. Like, we, <laughs> like, we watched it the other day and we were like, wait, what's he doing with yeah. the tape? Yeah, yeah. The tape was just like, what the tape was doing was just recording what I was playing and basically sending back an infinity loop. So when I opened the channel, you move, 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 is it a, Is it a tape echo? Well, it, 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 it yeah, it's, 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 what you do is, you, if you throw the tape machine into record, right. there's two heads, a record head and a playback head, and they're slightly apart. So it keeps kind of recording and playing back almost and creating yeah. that loop. Right. And so if okay. you open the channel that it's on, that's what Boom. it gives you. Right. That, that's the original dub effects that, you know, yeah. that's Perry and King Tubby used. That's mm, how yeah. they did it, you know, from mm. tape machines. And so... It was just, you know, that, I mean, between the records, obviously, it was, we used to call it doubling up. I know there were different terms for it in, in the States and stuff, just taking two copies of a record, mm. um, following it, say, either a beat, two beats, four beats behind, or, uh -huh. or whatever variant of that, um, you know, and then switching it and change. That's what I used to do, you know. So when I was in the clubs, everything, you know, everything was... I was playing was imported, but at the same time as this, I got every record that was released in the UK. The UK record companies sent me everything, and I've been getting it like that since I was like 17, you know, to thousands and thousands of records. Mm. But you know, they were sending me stuff I already had in a lot of cases, so it was very rare that something from UK. I mean, there was some great UK records that fitted in with it, but like Jed David Joseph, exactly that track. Mm. Um, so when they'd say release the track that had been big on our scene and it was going to come out in the UK, which is now the time where we're going to slow down from playing it. So a track had a shelf life of a few months. Okay. And if the record company got it out within, you know, if they got out like six weeks later than when we were playing on import or whatever, you know, once, once it was out, maybe a couple of weeks, and then we'd, 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 we'd moved from that because it was either taking off and, and it was going to the more commercial clubs or, you know. So, well, because I had a good relationship with the record company, but I always wanted to support these records when they came out. So what I'd say to them is, look, send me two copies in, in the end, you know, send me three copies, some, you know, going to that. Um, and I'd get a couple of extra weeks out of it by switching it around and, you know, and people would think it was a mix sometimes. They'd go into the record sh shop and say, we got that, the mix Greg Wilson play. And he's like, this that is your concern. He said, no, 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 he played, he played something different that night. So it was, it was a bit like that. So I kind of do my own version. And, and what happened there with David Joseph, that record just come out, you know, promo, UK promo. He was going to be on this channel for TV show, The Tube, from... Uh, London, uh, an outside broadcast from London. The, the tube was filmed in Newcastle. And um, they came, he was doing a personal appearance at Legend. They used to bring all these artists up free of charge just to kind of come and say, either say hello to sing, go over back in tape or, you know, sign autographs. And we'd have loads. And, you know, like we even had Gwen Guthrie and um, 
Oliver Cheatham from the States who came to mm. the legend, you know, the cool and the gang, but that was after a gig. But, you know, so David Joseph was doing a PA that night. Now I played his track using two, two copies and the people from the tube had seen this and said, oh, no, that's interesting. How do you fancy coming on and doing this live? And it's one of those things where in the first instance, it's like, wow, yeah, great. And the second instance, it's, oh, my God, what if this goes wrong? You know, and you're on the <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, was, it was a real terrifying kind of scenario because it's like, oh, God. And got up there, took my equipment and everything, stuck out the back of a hatchback car with my It's a lot of equipment. Yeah. It was a big setup. Can you walk yeah. us through the setup? Like the tech, I, I remember? I had the two, I had 1200s. Now, at that point, a few clubs had 1200s. DJs didn't have 1200s. A couple, of, I mean, Froggy had a pair. I had these. You know, it, this is rare, you know, like this, this kind of... I had a Matam mixer, which this DJ Froggy had designed, which is a beautiful mixer. It, it was like a custom-built mixer. Uh, I'd love to get another one, actually, you know, if I thought it must be expensive now. And Line then, faders or rotary? No, they had, they had uh, like, like faders, but what, what they did have, they had a, um, a cross, a, what do you call it? A cross, cross fader. Oh, cross, cross fader, fader, yeah. Uh -huh. which, which people weren't on mixers then. Mm. So this was like, it was rare to see. And I didn't even know, see that. Had like filters on it and stuff like that. It was a really interesting mixer. You know, it was beautiful kind of sound out of it and everything. It was very well, well put together mixer. Um, the, the Revox B77 and the tape machine. And how I'd come into that is when I started doing radio mixes for Pig Dilly, they, they always brought that particular model of tape machine it was an outside broadcast unit. It was a portable editing machine, basically. So the people who used it mainly were news editors. So if you were on the road doing a news report and you wanted to edit the story and get it back, you'd edit it on that. Those guys are amazing edit. They could edit voices, so you couldn't couldn't tell the difference. You know, they <laughs> uh, and so they bring it, tape it, take it back to the station, top and tail it, which is putting the leader tape on, and then it was broadcast ready. And one day there was no one to do that. And I'd gone back and I got into one of the booths and I just started editing it and just loved it. I just thought, wow, I really got into it. And so all of a sudden from being, my early mixes were, you know, live mixes in effect. They were recorded in the day at the club. They weren't recorded in front of an audience, but they were like as live. Eventually it was all studio based, very mm. slow. I mean, by the end of the year, the best of one, just so many edits in that. And very raw, you know. I mean, I just I used to think, oh, people, people really like it. I used to think, oh, you know, it, it's so, you know, naive in lots of ways. But I did two big end of the year mixes there that like, you know, still talked about now by people from 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 those times. So the you know, I, I decided after I'd started doing these mixes and I'd start, you know, I thought, wow, editing get my own equipment, put my own little kind of DJ studio together. And I'd done that. And that's what we took with us, uh, you know, to, to, to the tube. And, um, and when I was doing it, it actually says in the commentary that he said the cameraman nearly bumped the deck. I mean, I was aware of this cameraman for the moment I got in there because he was swinging the, he had a handheld. <laughs> <and he was laughs> in. But when he got me to do a little rehearsal, swinging it and I'm thinking, oh Jesus. And I'm thinking, because everything, when when he was interviewing me, Jules Holland, I'm, I know everything's queued up right. And I can see that cameraman about, I'm just thinking, please, please, you know, because if he bangs it, I'm in trouble, you know. You've got to start over. <laughs> Everyone's going to be. So, fortunately, he didn't. And I started, but he, and he says in the commentary, he bangs the deck and it didn't jump. He said, oh. the cameraman just banged the deck there. Mm. And, and it, it, it retained, and I, I got away with it because if he would have, it would have been a nightmare. And so, you know, then it just did me thing and it, it worked. A whole different legend. Yeah. A I whole, got, different, a whole different legend. Yeah, yeah. Got, this is Greg Wilson people. with the record jumping. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, the tomatoes, tomatoes to be thrown out. <laughs> Boo, they didn't get it. You thought they didn't get it then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was great. I remember getting back to Manchester and I did a club called The Legend. Um, not, I'm sorry, the Exit, The Legend. The exit, 
And, uh, you know, it was lovely, you know, all the people who'd seen it and they were like patting me on the back and saying, oh, nice one, that was great. And so, you know, it was, it was a nice thing to do, you know, and obviously anyone who was a DJ that was serious about what they were doing were tuned into that, you know, to see what was going on. There's a DJ mix in here, you know. Mm. And uh, so a lot of people obviously saw it and, and stuff, you know, and uh, it, it kind of elevated my own state. Well, it just got, I was just known by people. In, although, you know, that was already there because I used to do charts for Blues and Soul magazine and there were... DJs from all over the country in those charts. And I was I was going to London all the time. I visited the record companies regularly. I, you know, they'd send me all, all the, the 12s and the singles, but I'd go and get loads of albums up there and everything and get them from the offices. And, and I'd go out with them and go to all sorts of clubs in London. So I was, I was aware of what was going on there. You know, a lot of people were either in the North or in the South and they didn't know much about the other. But, you know, I was always open to, to kind of finding out and, you know, and see what was happening down there and what differences and what similarities and stuff. And, you know, it was great, you know, saw a lot of good things down there. Mm. If you had to take a guess today from collecting those records throughout the years, how big is the record collection now? Well, there's a sad tale to be told. Um, soon after I'd stopped DJing, I had a load of records stolen from the house. So oh, no. Oh, no. It's a very bleak, you know. I'm still kind of stars a bit now. And for years after that, what was worse was years after that, I'd go from, I'd look for a record because I mean, they're all in, I was about to move house and they were all boxed up. And and uh, it was kids, it was just kids who'd kind of, I had a dog at the time and I had somebody was, I was away for a few days, had them looking after my dog. And next thing there were loads of kids in, loads of records were nicked. Oh my God. Frisbeed and all sorts, it was horrible. Oh. It was really horrible. Um, but anyway, uh, at that point, you know, I kind of, you know, cause I go back in to look for, say for example, you know, I'd, let's say if I had, you know, seven, eight Earth, Wind and Fire albums, I'd go looking and I could only find five, you know, there were three mm. gone you know things i couldn't find and that happened over and you know when you go look for a record mm. oh, with that and yeah, yeah, yeah if everything's in order like it should be great you know going out best school but if it's not you're looking everywhere for it and then it's not there mm. you know, another one gone another one and it, so it was constantly this dagger that keeps kind of pressing oh in my god. Oh my so god. in the end i i i was like you know, I started buying CD at that point, you know, kind of, and, and trying to replace some stuff on CD or whatever. Because mm -hmm. um, I wasn't DJing or anything. And then when I come back to DJing in 2003, it was like, what do I do here? I don't want to be, you know, Mr. DJ Fossil from the old days, come back playing the old tunes in the same way. So I knew that. <laughs> but I didn't know whether I wanted to go down the, the CDJ route, I, you know, but then, you know, laptop because I was doing re-edits and everything like that. It just it seemed, you know, I got this program called PC DJ, which worked off a laptop at the time, and that that, that worked for me really well initially. I mean, I use CDJs now, but um, yeah. but in that in that period, I did, and that's so I'd have I'd have a computer, I'd have a Rebox, and um, I'd be controllers and everything. So the thing for me was it was the juxtaposition of like a kind of modern technology with antiquated technology. I wanted the balance. I didn't want to, you know, just like within the music, although I'm somebody who's drawing from the past, I'm doing it in a, because of the edits and stuff like that in a contemporary way. Mm. I'm done, I don't want to just be, I don't like the idea of kind of just trying to relive the past in a sense. Mm. And, you know, I like the the evolution. I love you know, the way the edit scene's taken a lot of these records and just made them sonically, just give them a bottom end maybe that that works for now. You know, works for or made them mixable, of course. You know, so you can right now and everything. So you know, I, and 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 a lot of them, are, you know, very very respectful to the original. It's not about trying to change it or better it. It's it's really about making it practically usable for 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 now you know mm -hmm. it brings me up 
to a moment I've been waiting to talk to you about forever. Okay. Um, you have the best essential mix of all time. I'm going to go all out time. there and say it. I don't think that's a hot take. I'm going to go not. out there and say it. It oh. is the greatest essential mix of all time, in my opinion. What were the steps you took when you were pitched the idea to do an essential mix? What goes through your mind? Kind of walk us through that process. Because you have so much music spanning decades and decades. How do you tell the Greg Wilson story in such a small amount of time? Okay. Well, how it worked was that previous to the essential mix, um, I did a mix online called Electro No Sellout Electrospective, which was a real shot of the electro era, you know, uh, it's online and everything. It was really involved because it had to be specific. So it wasn't a matter of, you know, I'll choose 20 tracks. It's, I would choose the biggest, what, 50 tracks or whatever it was from there. So all those have to be in the mix. So mm. it's, you know, And then I had to edit everything down to two and a half minutes per track and make it coherent, you know, it, it, so it's like, you've got to make it like, it, it's got the, the meat of the track in there. So I went through all this process and I did this electrospective mix and it was the most involved mix I'd ever done. And it was, I can remember saying at the time, you know, I'm glad I never have to do this again. I've done it now, you know, and, and uh, so when the essential mix came up, weirdly, I was in, um, San Francisco just got in the airport when my agent contacted me and said, oh, you'd be nice to do an essential mix. So <clears throat> what I decided, I think I'd been back DJing then about five years, 2009, 2003, but yeah, just, just, just over five years. So I thought what I'll do is I'll select from tracks that I've been playing in these past five years, whether it be, the original versions, the edits or whatever, but what's been big for me in these, you know, and so that was my playlist. And then the process was exactly what I'd done with the electro mix is to, to get these tracks and to coherently pull them into a certain length of time. And I did a lot more than with what was on the mix as well. <clears throat> I gave myself, I, I gave myself options here. So whereas the electro perspective, I was absolutely locked into those tracks with the essential mix. There could have been another kind of 15, 20 tracks or something, maybe more, you know, I, I, I prepared them all. So I had the options before I started the mix mm. and then, you know, went into it. And obviously it's a two hour mix. So mm -hmm. you went within that. And um, yeah, you know, I mean, when, when it went, because Radio 1 used to have this, jingle at, it, at that time it said in new music we trust and it was a big thing it was all over radio in new music we trust i'm thinking they're the same new music i'm playing so i kind of i knew it was a good mix don't get me wrong i knew that the people who liked it would like it you know i knew i put a lot into it but i thought a lot of people wouldn't like it and that was the other thing just not their thing or it's just too old and it's not and so i kind of expected a little bit of a you know, some some good feedback, but some people, no, nah, no. And when, and also I hadn't taken into account as well that the essential mix in Radio 1, it's heyday in many respects was the 90s. It was when it had the biggest listenership and everything. People actually tuned in on a Friday night. So I was almost looking at it that, you know, this was past the Lord Murr show in a sense. It was until the following day and realized online now it's all around the world and mm -hmm. it's just gone and the comments and everything was positive it was just like oh wow you know people love this and it you know the response to it was just like overwhelming because you know i hadn't expected you know it to be like that you know i, I as i say i expect i knew certain people knew the heads would like it but mm -hmm. everyone seemed to like it and and then the following year radio one it was they'd had it was the five hundredth mix and they did like they chose ten mixes to the whole you know seventeen year history of the show and the, and it was in there again <laughs> and then about <laughs> five or six years later Rolling Stone did greatest internet mixes of all time and put it in there too 
So it's a gift that keeps giving for me, you know. It's, <laughs> even last year, like Radio One played it again because it's they have a kind of classic essential mix kind of thing. And so, you know, it, I, you know, I, I kind of some people said, would you do another one? And I, for the 10, 10 years, I, I think I might if they would have come for me, you know, ten years after I'd done it, I might have thought. But in a way, I like the idea it's the only one, you know. I mean, I could do it again, and I could do it with the other tracks that I didn't use the first time, plus tracks that I've been playing. I could do the whole process again now. But, you know, it's like a see, it's like a movie sequel generally, isn't it? You know the story now, and it's just like a repeat of what was, was gone before, you know. Um, you don't have the shock value of the first mix, you know, and I think that's what it had, is that a lot of people discovered the re-edits culture through that and everything and um, and it connected them to a lot of the black music from the past and, and you know a lot of tracks come through there that now, now I see DJs playing that no one was playing you know but back then you know that like something like um, Q the voice of Q mm. you know that that's been re-released since and everything and, and stuff but you know when I started DJing again I remember I did a, a night that's a deep that deep electro song that's like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, when That's I first got DJing again, you know, like, and it, the forums were still going then. I remember I did a night, and there was only about maybe hundred people in there, but a lot of um, a lot of DJs were there. And I remember they were like coming over asking what certain stuff was, and Voice of was was one of them then. And the, and the next day on a DJ floor, everyone was saying, "Oh, this track Voice of and they're talking about it there, and. So yeah, you know things like Thug Rock, Sandy Kerr, you know that's you know but these tracks that have been forgotten about in a way that now people have, have picked up on and you 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 hear them about more. You know you suddenly you suddenly doing a gig with a DJ and he's like twenty five and he's playing like something. You're like, wow, <laughs> like that's my <laughs> shit. <laughs> Where did you get that from? They're like they're really into it. They're it's all new discovery for them, you know. And so uh, that's great, you know. That's awesome, man. That Greg, is. that is that is the that is that mix is very important to a lot of guys like us who yeah. are these oh, fucking so sad, disco you know. nerds. And you know, like voice, I'm pretty sure that's where I've probably heard yeah, there's, something I think, and there's so many other tracks in there that I'm like, oh yeah, yeah the Greg Wilson version. I never I never kind of I don't think I mentioned anywhere, but if you notice the mix actually uh slows down and then speeds up again so yeah. it starts off like around about 122 or something with the originals but you know it, it actually goes down to 100 bpm uh -huh. and then back up again before the end and that was done in the sense of that's how clubs used to be it didn't used to be uh you know everything like nowadays you know it's almost, almost like linear it goes like that you know so uh -huh. where it was like that and kind of, you know, it, the night moved in different directions. It's like when we talk about legend and stuff like that, as you can see, if you do a jazz break, it changes the dynamic of it. And then you go back into, you know, your other tracks, you might play a few kind of down tempo grooves, you know, and, and it that works through, through, that's how it was through the night. It wasn't like you started at your slowest pace and you end up at your highest pace, which a lot of DJing kind of become, you know, since then. So, it was just a little kind of nod back to that, you know, like mm -hmm. the variation and the tempo on it. Yeah. That that in the Genesis is good DJing though, is those peaks right. and valleys, you know, and, and that I think has since gotten lost with the festival circuit and all of that, where everyone's like, we have to play 125, 128 the whole time, yeah. you know, and these these listeners aren't really going on a voyage. They're just going at a, on a roller coaster that's just 100 miles an hour you right know? and that's why you yeah. got to appreciate yeah. those skrillexes yeah. and those um yeah you know those dj snakes that that'll that'll dip into those 100 and yeah. and then they'll go right back up when you said the roller coaster there that was interesting i remember being at a movement festival in detroit and i can't remember who was djing but i was watching it was a, a I, I played in the afternoon i was watching and it was one of the big big djs and i was looking at the crowd and it struck me that it was like a fur ground ride with the crowd, that the music took them a certain way and then they exploded and then they bring it down there and then it's a roller coaster. Mm. And that kind of, and it's like, okay, I get it. You know, 
because I think that's their vibe. For me, on a personal level, I love the variation. I've always been about that. That's where I come from, my background. So when it became house all night long, when it became everything went one way, when it became DJs now don't play a wide spectrum, but they narrow down to one specific type, that didn't sit too right with me. You know, I mean, I wasn't, I always remember speaking to a DJ in the late 80s, just as a rave that I wasn't DJing then, and there was a Primal Scream track come together. I was talking, and he said, oh, I love that track, it's great. I said, do you play out? No, I couldn't play out, far too slow. And I, he said, I don't play anything under, under 120 BPM. And I, and I kept hearing this, and I, you know, you get to thinking in the end, you know, people don't realize, if they, if they think that dance music is only above 120 BPM, you can wipe James Brown off, you know. Yeah. Get rid of all that because yeah. all that is grooved down. I, I think this is it, you know. When the acid house scene came about, a lot of it was about white kids learning how to dance because white lads did not dance. They, they, if you saw a, like a normal everyday club back then. The girls danced and the guys stood around the side. They maybe put up a bit of courage to move and have a little bit of a dance with a girl, but there was no dancing culture apart from the girls. The girls loved dancing, but the guys, either the girlfriend pulled them up on the floor or they were trying to kind of move in on another girl. That was the only reason, generally. Apart from the specialist scenes, once you get to the Northern Soul, jazz from then people are, you know, serious about, about the dancing. And so, you know, with with what was happening there is, it, for me, a lot of it was about white lads freeing their inhibitions and letting it go on the dance floor. And it's the first time, you know, they'd done it in, in mass like that. But they were dancing to the beat. And I think that's why it became 120 BPM because it's like clock rate, you know, it's that. And they were, they were on the beat, but obviously, when you look at the black screen. <laughs> we can't veer off the path too far. We just figured out 128. We can't, we can't slow us down. No. <laughs> so in fact, they've learned, they've learned about beats, but they hadn't learned Oh, my the God. Groove. I'm glad you said it. No, yeah, we can't. <laughs> ain't got the groove. I remember I was in Rio once talking to someone in Rio de Janeiro, and there was like this pattern on the thing, and it kind of was like an A, and it squirreled around, and in between the was like like a spot and it kind of went around. I was talking about this very thing and I said, see there, there's the beats and that's the groove. And they're dancing to the beat and they're missing the groove. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was like when drum and bass came about, it was a perfect example because drum and bass almost was like half the tempo that you you could take it at that fast, but also so that kid was dancing to the groove. When you when you saw like in the early days, <laughs> kind of the beat. They, they, were like, they thought it was this tempo, <laughs> like, really quick, and it's like, no, you haven't quite got. You that. gotta you gotta get you, half the speed. Down <laughs> on it. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> that's a, that's a big difference. Beat and groove to me is a big difference. Like, yes, uh, thousand percent. It is. It it's is. It's a uh, it's a nuance. Yes. It's that like cl clapping on the clapping the on the one and the three versus two and the four. <laughs> you yeah, know, there you go. Right. <laughs> you can see it. You know who's in the wrong here. And, yeah. It's not wrong, but it's not right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we uh, I love that. I love the idea of just like we just learned the steps. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you can speed it up, but don't slow it down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. God. Oh uh, my God. Greg, the book is called Discotech Archives. It came out in 2022. Uh, tell our listeners a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, we are, we are, in the end, we got it out January 23. We had like a few delays on it. Um, but yes, it was like, there it is, Discotech Archives. Boom. <laughs> yes. It was originally a series for DJ Magazine uh, back in about 2016. The premise of it is that uh, there's four categories, classic DJ, classic uh, venue, classic record, and classic label. So there's basically paid song sections on, on each of these. So there's 30 classic DJs in the book, which who's 
faces you can see all here. A guy called Pete Fowler did amazing illustrations for, for them. Um, what I'm trying to do really, I mean, when, when, I, when it started with DJ Magazine, you know, I knew that the, their audience was a younger audience and, you know, they'd asked me to do something based on dance music history. And so I thought, yeah, what do, yeah, and they give me like two pages. So I could have done one thing over two pages about a subject, but I thought, nah, you know, it needs to be more bite size, you know, if you want to track kind of, so I kind of, four things and this is where the four categories came from and so we did the series and then during lockdown uh i put out a limited run paperback edition of it which flew out it was like mad you know like we we, we hoped to do 500 and the order just blew in and, and before we knew it we we, we did 1600 and capped it and said because it's not going to be much of a limited edition if we do any more of this and that was great but at that point i thought well I want to extend it, add new c categories into it, add new, you know, new features into it, um, and and do it as a hardback. And so, got it out. You know, I was originally wanted to get it out in in, in December, and then we had like um, all manner of we had like post office strikes, ransomware attacks, all sorts of stuff. Which <laughs> was kind of uh, everything delayed. that could have gone happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, delays from the prints and all that, but. You know, we, we got it in, uh, got it out for like early January and everything. So, and it's it's doing great. You know, it's really good, really good. And the response to it has been fantastic. Doing a series of nights at the minute where I'm doing like talks about the book, but also DJing as well and playing music from the book. You know, in this case, the ori original tracks rather than edits or anything. You know, because it's all pre-rave. The mm. book, we don't go past you know like mid eighties. So we don't go into house. I mean, it's only because it's been written about so much, you know, that people know that story. This this is the side of the story that I want to bring to the fore. So people, and, and all these people that we've been talking about, you know, like Count Suckles and, uh, you know, there's Count Suckle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you got like um, people like uh, James Hamilton's a very, he was a writer in England. He was a DJ from the 60s. Uh, he was the guy that was more responsible than anyone for getting mixing going in this country. He, he went on a crusade for it in his magazine. I remember what this one issue, he just decided he was going to BPM all these things and nobody knew what BPMs were then. And all of a sudden, this whole list of BPMs and, or, you know, the, the top 100 disco chart that he did in his magazine. And so, you know, he was pushing that, that side. So, you know, these, these are people that aren't really kind of given you know certainly from the british side i mean a lot of the america you know you've got people like um you know obviously david mancuso cool herc you know sharon white anita sarko you know new york djs female djs who you know like were real trailblazers there um people like t scott obviously grandmaster flowers who was yes original grandmaster before flash and well, he, I mean, he played, he was DJing with James Brown at, I think, Yankee Stadium in something like 68. He, mm -hmm. So the idea of a DJ being on with a, a big artist like that, you know, so he must have, uh, he must have been something around that time. You know, you know, lots of, you know, lots of people, Ken Collier is one of the new ones, Detroit DJ that I've managed to bring into play. And um, so it, it, it's it's been really good to kind of get that. And it's the same with the venues, you know, that you'll have, your, you know, your kind of Studio 54 size places and Paradise Garages. This, this, you know, I, I want to talk, but I also want to talk about, you know, the smaller influential things that went on, you know, clubs that, I, I did a club for a match called the Reno, which was basically... A club that opened in the in the sixties in Moss Side. It was very much the front line of Moss Side. Um, you know, a very much a, a black kind of environment, and away from the mainstream of the scene, people didn't talk. But the amount of people that went through that club and the amount of influence they had in that, the these stories you want to bring through more and and give people. In the end, when when I was writing the 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 last lot of pieces I'm, I'm also thinking how does everything connect so at the end of the first book I, uh, you the the paperback 
I did an afterword and I kind of realized by that point, I hadn't mentioned like possibly my favorite producer of all time, Norman Whitfield, mm. you know, who's so integral to, you know, like what he did with the Temptations was like a proto disco kind of, and then later he does Undisputed Truth, he plus me does Rolls Royce and all that stuff that they were doing, you know, <clears throat> and I hadn't mentioned him. But then I thought, okay, Rolls Royce, I haven't mentioned them either. If I do another one, we'll do Car Wash because then I can bring Norman Whitfield into play and I can yes. tell that story. And that's what I'm trying to do is give a little bit of the stories, a little bit of the cross connections, let this web come together, show people how how connected these things are. You know, like we just talked before that uh, a foul kind of dance record made by reggae musicians in London can be the influence on Francois K to bring a dub sensibility into remixing in New York, you know, who'd have thought the, the, so all these little things start to interconnect in strange ways. And, and, and it's interesting. So I like the fact that there is a balance between, well, I, I, like classic and cool classic. You have the same in records, you know, like, so, I think it'd be a cool classic record, a Booster Q, you know, whereas Rocker's Revenge Walking on Sunshine will be a classic because everyone has yeah. heard it. Not everybody's heard the voice, but well, I know that in the right environment that that is just, you know, a loved record. And if you can widen that, because, you know, a lot of those people at the time that weren't aware of this black music scene would have loved those records if they were informed, if they happen to read the right magazines or tune into the right radio station and know this was going on, you know, but it was another planet to them at the time. So they never came into that contact. So for them to hear it now, and I think a lot of the people that are buying, you know, these kind of records are maybe people who've been through the rave scene who are now looking back and what came before it and starting to, oh, wow, well, you know, there's all this going on and 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 so it creates a kind of new market there on that level so yeah i think so a lot of people from that period who weren't at the party so to speak uh, are now catching up on it in a sense i mean you see that in somewhere like australia i mean they've got a really good disco scene you know they're really they've had it going for a good, a good time some some great clubs great djs playing stuff out there but if you go back into their culture you know it's very little black music on the radio it's all it's very rock based mm. you know uh, so the it's almost like these kids have kind of looking at the, the, their parents they were looking at the wrong music and now they're starting to look in the right way i mean <laughs> you know there's a kind I of like that you know, it, it, interestingly as well new zealand has a big black music culture and the reason for that was that in australia you know obviously their aboriginal population was completely downtrodden and you know not given it was different with the Maori population in New Zealand, where there was some kind of inclusivity. So radio in New Zealand in the 70s might be playing James Brown and might be playing reggae. And you've got a big reggae scene out in, in New Zealand and stuff. It's really odd because they were, it's, it's the access to the music. It's just this, it's like funk in itself, you know, funk in the UK never got on the radio. It was pure club. Yeah. It was, you know, um, no radio. I mean, the odd track broke through, but not not much at all. It was very much a kind of club thing. Whereas the, if the radio would have been braver, it would have been playing, you know, this stuff. Because we know that now with hindsight, how great this music is, you know. And, and yet it was completely ignored at a certain point in time by people who had the power to kind of uh, bring it to a wider audience. So is the book, a, is it a volume one? Are we doing a car wash volume two? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe in five years I might extend it. <laughs> I can't imagine it's. I can't imagine it's a uh, an easy. It is task. what it is for now until I kind of go. But I mean, I, I'm also I'm going to write uh, a book. You know, I, I say. I keep calling it my my own book, although this isn't. But this this that is your own book. In terms of like, um, I want to write about that early eighties period in more depth about what happened, how these scenes 
uh, connected and everything, how the, the black crowd in the UK was, you know, like uh, the catalyst for what, what happened later with the rave scene. Obviously, the Hacienda comes into that, you know, the Electro. So, so all this, these kind of things I want to bring into a single book. You into know. a proper book, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's my intention. So that that's something that will happen. But I've learned with this book, Malarkey, that you can't rush these things, that it takes its time. So like if you're making a track in the studio, you've got to listen through the track, you know, to it, it takes a eight minutes or 10 minutes or whatever for you to do that. If you've got to go through a book, you've got to read the whole damn thing. And it takes like ages, you know, like so to go <laughs> through. It's a different process, you know, like, and you know, you're always like, you're always, you'll always find little typos here and there. They drive me mad, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, but you know, it, it's one of those things. It's, it's a very, I, I can only, Anyone who wrote books before there were computers, I can't understand how, you know, all the, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they literally wrote somehow. books. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, I, I need a good word processing to, to even have a, a chance. Yeah. Well, the, I hope that people can get their hands on this book that everyone should definitely read because yeah. I feel like if anyone is going to do these artists justice with a, a sense of white glove treatment it is you sir yeah so. absolutely i'll do i've got a bit of a plug if they want to get it uh, you need to go to uh, www.superweirdsubstance.com super weird substance yes uh, the book's available from there absolutely um before we take off we have one question that we always ask our guests and we're going to leave it kind of open up to you um it's actually two questions i want to ask the first one um we have a, a playlist for the podcast you can add any song you want uh what would you like to add to it well let's put on love money tw funk masters <laughs> we'll that and yes. perfect and voice of q we gotta we'll just do both okay. Okay. yeah, Both yeah. voice of q in there too We'll do a two for on that one. And last but not least, if you could give any advice. Um, by the way, instrumental version of Voice of Q, not, not the Yeah, the, yeah, the dub. On there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no vocal on this. Um, it's, got, it's got a vocal on there, but not as much vocal. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, last but not least, if you could give advice uh, to any upcoming producers and DJs, what would you like to share with them? Well, you know, I mean, it, it's... it's uh, Obviously, it's a world where there's a lot of people out there who call themselves DJs and producers. I mean, in the old days, to be a producer, you have to get in a recording studio. And to get in a recording studio, it costs money. Whereas now, everyone can make music on, you know, on the computers and everything, which I, on one level is great. On another level, ain't so great. It's a mm. double-edged sword, really, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I think it's always about following your convictions. If you believe in something, stay with it and go with it. It might not kind of happen immediately, but if, if you really believe in that, go down that route and stay with it. Don't kind of veer off away from it and or follow what you think somebody else, you know, is, is doing or whatever, you know, because it, 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 DJing is all about, it's, it's, it's all about us enforcing our, our kind of um, musical personality with the audience, you know, that, we're trying to bring forward what we're into, you know, what excites us, you know. So to do that, I think you, you've got to kind of give it its time. Don't expect things to happen overnight. You know, same with production. It's like, again, work out what you want to do and, and go for it, you know. Don't, it, it, cause it's so easy to veer off, you know, somebody starts out wanting to make this type of track and they end up doing something completely different. I mean, that's what happened with the record companies all the time. You know, they, they have these real kind of uh, hungry artists with great ideas, want to do something. And before they know it, they've been put with a producer from the record company side and they're making something that isn't, I, I know so many bands from the past who go, that record we put out wasn't, it wasn't what we wanted to do. Mm. They just, so I think you've got to, you know, stand by your own convictions and, you know, if you believe in something, 
stay with that, stay with that, you know, trust your convictions. The legend, Greg Wilson. Legend. Thank you, Man. thank you, sir. Lovely talking to you guys. Found it. Look at that, look <laughs> at that. <laughs> An absolute honor. Oh, there it is, yeah. It's a repress. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Jura one, isn't it? It's the Isle of Jura repress. Yeah, there. yeah, exactly. I think that's from Australia. Yeah, I'm looking right now. It's yeah, it's yeah. So it's the instrumental. That's the one. Yeah, that's yeah. The, one. Yeah. The, the vocal's got too much vocal. <laughs> yeah, <it's>, yeah. <laughs> it's Greg, vocal, yeah. it's been an absolute honor, sir. Uh, yeah. We're so happy to have joined you today. Thank you a million and you times. Too. Just Lovely. You, you enjoy the rest of your day. It's earlier there. I'm gonna kind of chill into the night now. You you have a good day, guys. Thank hey, you so much, Greg Wilson. I really appreciate that, bro. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you soon.